The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Remember this, when you're the greatest fighter in the world today, they got a name for you. They don't call you a great fighter, they call you Chael Sonnen. Beat me, if you can. And after tonight, none of you in this ring will ever Talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kid stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine like jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Woo! I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. And I have in my cold beer. You have your cold beer? If not, you are fucking jabroni. Wash it down with one beer, two beers, three beers, a shot of whiskey. You become a motherfucker. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Welcome to the second episode of the FRB show. I am, of course, Front Row Brian, internet legend, talked about on Sports Center, the worldwide leader in sports. And I was well ahead of the curve with this CM Punk news. I told you two weeks ago CM Punk was coming to the UFC, and they said, FRB, are you crazy? And I said, yeah, I am a little crazy. But I'm always right. So we have a great show. Uh, some really great guests like uh, Malki Kawa, the manager for John Jones, the best fighter that has ever walked in an MMA ring or cage or whatever fighting service we're talking about. So Malki lends his insight into the, the inner business workings of the UFC. We talk a little bit about his prize client, of course. Then we also have the best damn welterweight in the world, Ben Askren. And he tells us about uh, all kinds of stuff, but uh, mostly the uh, the bald fat guy, Dana White. And also Justin McCulley, a.k.a. American Fedor. He wants to fight with Tito Ortiz. And uh, he makes his case, and it's a pretty convincing case. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for listening last week to that marathon of a show that I, I really should have uh, caught up. But, uh, you know, th this is a new gig for FRB. So I, I'm learning and uh, just trying to piece it all together as I go. But I guarantee you it's always going to be entertaining. When I'm running the show, it's entertainment. That's what I do. So uh, please uh, excuse some of my... Uh, inexperience with this and uh you know just uh bear with me and i guarantee I'll, I'll make it worth your time so uh with that enjoy the show and this next guest is uh sort of a, a controversial figure in the business but uh he does manage the greatest fighter in the world today, John Jones. His name is Malki Kawa. What's going on, Malki? No, nothing, buddy. Um, when you make these introductions, please make them correct. <laughs> I don't manage the greatest fighter of our era today. He's the greatest fighter of all time. Of all time. Better than anybody you've ever seen. So just make sure when you introduce me and introduce him, you just do it correctly from now on. Now, I thought you were going to say, Brian, introduce me as the advocate for the reigning, defending UFC light heavyweight champion. But uh, you're still you're still not stealing Heyman's gimmick or, or what? Uh, well, Heyman took the gimmick from me a long time ago, and he had a, he has a better platform as the WWE. <laughs> right. So, uh, Malky, for, for some of the people, I, I mean, because I... And therefore, I can't take it with it. Yeah. For some of the people, Hello? I mean, I, I kind of know your background a little bit, but tell everybody about how first round management and, and how you got into this game. <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know what? 
started the football first a while ago, back in 2005. And um, I had a real estate company at the time, a mortgage company, where I did, uh, we did real estate and titles and mortgage. And, and um, dude, we, we, you know, we had a couple different offices across the state of Florida and a bunch of brokers that worked for me. And, and we did very, very well. And like most people know, seven that were in real estate or that had their money in real estate, when the markets came crashing down and when everything came crashing down, um, that it was kind of tough to stay in it. But while I had that and had that uh, that uh, that business going, I decided to get into sports um, because I got asked to get into it by certain football players. And I started in football. And at, when 07 came around, everything just started kind of coming apart. Me and my kid's mom broke up. Uh, the markets came crashing down, so the business went away. Um, and my dad got diagnosed with stomach cancer towards the end of 07. So to kind of relieve stress and to, you know, just to work out and, and then try to, you know, stay in shape and all that type of stuff, I ended up uh, going to a, an American top team gym where Conan Silvera was coaching at. But it wasn't Coconut Creek where all the other guys were at. It was a uh, like a satellite gym. And I ran into Conan, who was actually my coach. He trained me in jiu-jitsu way back, like, in 1998, 99. Um, anyway, like, I'd only done it for a couple months. So I've never really done jiu-jitsu for longer than a few months at a time. And I seen him, and, you know, we, we, we reconnected. It was kind of weird because um, I remembered him, and he barely remembered me, but he did. And, you know, he was like, so, you know, what do you do now? And I told him that, you know, I, I was a sports agent. And he's like, hey, I had this kid I want you to meet. He, <clears throat> you know, he's a, he's a great fighter, and um, he's someone that you should talk to and uh, help out because he needs it, you know. And I, I had no clue really about the sport. I, you know, I, I knew about Chuck and Randy and Tito pretty much. I watched uh, the very first. <clears throat> the very first few UFCs, and then after that, I really kind of just concentrated on, on football. And from there, I went up to Coconut Creek with Cole, and he introduced me to a kid by the name of Tiago Alves. And Tiago Alves happened to become my very first client. And from there, we just slowly built uh, first-round management into an MMA powerhouse. And by doing that, I also kind of you know got away from football. I needed to concentrate on one, and I chose MMA. And you know, looking back now, it's probably the best decision I made. But coincidentally, you know, now this year I, I got relicensed in football and I'm going back into uh, into the NFL as well. Interesting. So, so are you, are you going to have clients for the upcoming NFL draft? I hope so. That's what the that's what the plan is. Oh yeah, yeah. Because it, it, it's too early to have them officially. They're probably correct. Right. Right. Well, you got to reach them, and you're right. You have to sign. I, I can't sign anybody until after they're they're done playing. So. So tell us a little bit, because I, I know you have a very unique relationship with John Jones, which is, it's it's a little bit rare to see it. It's refreshing, because I've seen some other big stars, they, you know, they have blow-ups with their manager, they go to William Morris Endeavor, and then they never talk to the guy that brought them to the dance, so to speak. And you seem to have this brother-like relationship with John Jones, so... Take us back a little bit. How did you get into the John Jones business, and what's the relationship like with John? Well, you know, John Jones, um, I, I first watched him fight UFC 100. I watched him fight live, and I thought to myself, you know, what is the uh, matchup? But this kid had uh, uh, Stephen Bonner. He, you know, he fought Stephen Bonner. And I looked, and I thought to myself that this was, you know, a little bit of a, of a fast uh uh, it was too fast, I think, at the time to give him Stephen Bonner as an opponent. Um, in my mind, at that time, he, I didn't know who John Jones was. This was his second fight in the UFC. His first fight was nice, but it wasn't like you know, it wasn't this like outstanding John Jones. Yet. His, his skills were not yet honed or fine tuned. You know what I mean? And but I knew that he was kind of like the future. You look at his size, you look at his weight, you look at his speed, his strength, and you look at also like where he was at at the time, like who he was training with. And you say to yourself, man, what would this guy do if he was with a uh, Greg Jackson or an American Top Team at the time, or? Uh, you know, one of these other big, like an AKA, one of these other, you know, academies have had not like, world champs and trade these type of guys. You know, what would we have with this guy? I mean, physically, he was just above everything I'd ever seen in the sport. Um, and then it just coincidentally, dude, he was at, a, at a, an appearance that I had scheduled for Tiago Alves. And him and Tiago started talking, and he gave Tiago his number, and uh, he took my number from Tiago, and he called me. <laughs> and he had to start looking into representing him. Um, because of the fact that, you know, he liked the way I had taken care of Tiago. Tiago had nothing but good things to say. And I, you know, I uh, went and, and signed him. And, and, yeah, our relationship is very good. And it's, it's one that's been built 
over the course of time. I mean, there's things I've done for John that um, I don't think anyone else has. I don't think any managers has the relationship or the uh, the ability to do the things that I've done for John that they would have done for other guys. I think, I mean, let me not say the ability, but you know what I mean? Like, I think I've just done things for him throughout the course of time that a lot of agents I don't think would have done. Um, I hear stories about how some other guys uh, <laughs> excuse me, work with their guys, and I think I'm a little bit more hands-on, and, and, and uh, my relationship with him is just different. It just is. You know, he requires more. He's the biggest. He's the biggest star in the sport, and it just requires more. So I think at the end of the day, it's like uh, it's one of those things where. So what do you what do you, you know, I, I, what do you think about I, these I guys? Will come through. I get a lot of stuff done. There's a lot of things going on. Sure, sure. So what do you so, think about some of these guys that will go and sign with William Morris and Dever? And I mean, John has a similar agency. Is it William Morris or Creative or CAA? No, it's, it's William Morris. But I mean, w- 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 tell me who you're referencing, though. Just like, like, let me know what you mean by when you say these guys. Who are these guys? Well, like Weidman has somebody with William Morris. Ronda Rousey has Brad Slater at William Morris. And I, I don't know who's doing her fight contracts. Yeah, I mean, listen, here's the thing. So William Morris doesn't do the fight contract because they represent the UFC, so it's a conflict of interest. So technically they're not supposed to do the contract. Um, but, um, you know, I, I know Weidman has a manager. I know Weidman does his marketing and his TV stuff through William Morris. <coughs> um, I know I know that's how we have it set up with John as well. Um, we... Um, we work together. Like me and William Morris work together. Me and Brad Slater, we work together on his movie stuff. Brad gets all the movie things together, and then obviously me and John go through them. Um, and then, you know, the whole marketing team there, uh, me and them are in constant contact almost daily on different opportunities and different things. I mean, I work really well with William Morris. I enjoy them a lot. Call them anytime I need something. Um, they're pretty much able to open doors for me that maybe I wouldn't be able to do by myself or, you know, a shortcut to get to where I got to get to without having to do it all by myself. That's the beauty of William Morris. And that's why... Um, you know, it worked out. But I think that um, guys will quickly find that William Morris is a mega agency with thousands and thousands of clients. And it's not something where you can just be like, okay, I'm going to go get signed by William Morris. It doesn't work that way. And, you know, they're not just sitting there looking at deals for John and Rhonda. It's The Rock and Denzel Washington and this guy and that guy and all these different people. So having me around, you know, obviously what I did is, you know, I get with John <clears throat> and we, we go through what he wants, what he's looking for, what he needs. And you know, the way I look at it is just, we just have to get to a certain point. We, you know, it's like we're, it's like if you get in a car, it's like you're, you're carpooling, right? You're trying to get from one part of the country to the other. doesn't matter how you get there. doesn't matter who actually ends up driving it or who gets it there. As long as you get there, that's, that's my point. <laughs> and that's where William Morris has been awesome with because whether they get the deal or I get the deal, it, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? We just we work together on a lot of different things and, you know what I mean? I, I, I head up all of John's stuff. I get all, you know, the majority of his deals. And William Morris has been phenomenal in, in, in aiding in that. And there's some deals that they get on their own. And it's just, it's just an awesome relationship. So, um, but, you know, you go look at the creative artist situation. It's just, it should be the same way. But I think they try to take everything uh, from the fighter. The, they want the fight contract and they want this and they want that. So, you know, the issue here is that people don't understand how to work the UFC and the politics in the UFC and how it actually works. So where these agencies are used to dealing with a unionized sport, you know, they come to ours and it's completely different and they end up failing because of it. And, you know, every, all these guys think they have these connections that, oh, you know, he's, he's a great fighter. We're going to get him a sponsorship. And then they quickly find out that those relationships they had at whatever company are willing to do deals in basketball or football or baseball or hockey or NASCAR because it's all accepted. And fighting is still one of those sports where there needs to be a lot more teaching and explaining. It's not accepted yet as, well, as much as the other ones. And therefore, a lot of those guys in these big firms realize really quickly that unless they're John Jones or Ronda Rousey, there isn't going to be a deal for, for anyone else. So, you know, it is, just, it is what it is. If you, you know, everybody's very misinformed about the sport. The athletes, I think, sometimes are misinformed about the sport. A lot of the agents out there misinformed about the sport. And it's just one of those things where there still needs to be a lot more education across the board for everyone. Sure, sure. It makes a lot of sense. You, you talk about guys with connections and, you know, maybe uh, CAA or William Morris can't get it done, which is amazing to me. But there was a, a video clip on, I don't know if it was on UFC.com, and it was, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Wayne Harriman, and it said John Jones' manager. And it was kind of confusing to people because they were like, well, 
well, what happened to Malky? But of course, you are his manager. But could you explain the relationship with Wayne Harriman and how he helps facilitate some of the deals for first round management? Well, listen, here's the thing. I mean, the reality of it is it's like this, right? If, if my brother is the guy that we deals well with uh, Nike, then my brother will go and deal with Nike. If um, I'm the one that deals with, you know, uh, Beats by Dr. Dre, then I'll go deal with Beats by Dr. Dre. If Wayne Harriman deals, deals well with Dana Lorenzo, then he will. I mean, you know, there's, I have in my company, there's about 10 or 15 people that work for me. So um, the reality of it is, is that when all, everybody was like, oh, what happened? About, you know, again, I don't have to be the guy that's always in the forefront. But if you go back and review and you look at the second embedded film video, if you remember, um, the first one, supposedly, yeah, we're doing this deal with John Jones' manager and Wayne showed up. And then, you know, um, that was it. The second time around, if you remember, I was there and so was John. And we walked in there and then we came out and the deal was finally done. Everything was all good to go. So, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. I don't, you know, it's like it doesn't, I don't care. For the, you know, when I first started, everything was about being on Twitter and being hyped up and <laughs> in everyone's face and whole nine and all that. And, and I just, at this point now, I just don't, I don't do that anymore. So I don't care. So the whole world was like, oh, Wayne Harriman, this and that and the other. At the end of the day, every single deal, everything that happens when it comes to John Jones, you know what I mean? I pretty much am the one that sets it up. Numbers-wise, deal-wise, uh, going after it-wise, timing-wise, all that stuff. There isn't really much that I'm not involved in or not getting done. Now, who might be the guy that goes in and spearheads it, whether it's with a sponsor, whether it's a UFC, whether it's a legal matter, whatever it might be, it depends on who might have that relationship. And it doesn't always mean it's me. Sometimes I'll send Brad Slater to handle certain things. I, I just don't have contacts in, in Hollywood the way he does you know what I mean? I utilize my team around me to make everything work out for all my clients, not just John. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. But that's what it is. Me and Wayne work together the same way. You know, I've got an attorney out in Vegas that works with us as well. You know what I mean? I have an attorney in Miami that works with us. I've got three guys in New York City that work for me. You know, I've got guys that work in other states for me. So in other words, it doesn't really matter. Do you understand where I'm coming from? It doesn't really matter. And I don't really care what people think or say, but Wayne's a part of this team and, 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 you know, when I need Wayne to get certain things done, Wayne gets certain things done. Yeah, and I, I have noticed a, a difference in you. I guess we might have met three or four years ago, and it was. It was kind of like you wanted to be uh, Drew Rosenhaus. You know, you, you wanted to be the guy uh, in the forefront. And I, I've noticed in the past few years you've, you've kind of uh, not gone underground. I mean, uh, you know, but um, a little bit different, a little bit different person. I'm just me, and the reality of it has been is that when you're building a business, you have to get out and people need to know who you are, and I think that they do now. So I don't need to try to be in the forefront of every interview, every meeting, every every uh, opportunity. Um, and I never really tried to do that in, 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 uh, before. You know, I, just, I think a lot of things have died down. You know, people are not as as uh, have interested in asking me to do stuff like this podcast or whatever. You know what I mean? Because I, I shun a lot of it away. I don't even. Like, I don't have. The truth is, honestly, to um, FRB, I don't have time for a lot of it. You know what I mean? I'm in meetings most of the day. I've got a nine-year-old daughter who, when I'm not working, I'm trying to hang out with her or my family. You know what I mean? So I don't have the time to sit here, you know, um, to do the work I do for these guys and then turn around and also try to build this NFL business and then to turn around and be giving an interview every time somebody turns around and asks me for one about something that happened in MMA that has nothing to do with me. You follow me? Uh, I mean, I get asked for stuff like, you know, how do you feel about this decision that happened to this fighter? I don't even rep the fighter. You know I mean? Don't you think the judge should be changed? It's like, dude, I don't know. I'm fine for this. You know what I mean? So yeah, and and for the people, so it's it's it, it, it's you know that's that's the truth behind it. I don't I just I just don't care like that anymore to try to like you know get out there. People know that they you know that if I've got something to say, I'm going to say it. Sure. Yeah, and you know the only reason I bring up Wayne Harriman is the guy has such an interesting background. Uh, 1997, Chuck and Chuck Liddell, Tito were basically living on his couch and. He tells Tito right. Ortiz, a, a very young Tito Ortiz, hey, I got this guy for you, and I want him to be your manager. And that young uh -huh. guy's, that guy's uh, name happened to be Dana White. And right. that you talk about the relationships. So Wayne has this, re this relationship with Dana and the Fertitas that I, I don't think anybody could possibly replicate because if he doesn't tell a very young Tito – Hey, I got this guy for you, Dana White. There, Dana White never gets this opportunity with the UFC. You might be right. You might be right. I mean, but see, again, where a lot of people sit there and try to bash me, 
for doing business with him and stuff like that. I just tend to think I'm the smartest manager out there, out, out of these, out of all these guys, because no one else saw what I saw. You know I mean, everybody else runs away from it, and that goes for every manager. I don't care who they are; they all know. They all met him before me. They all knew him before me. I was the only one that went out there and said, "Hey, you're the guy that did this, and you're the guy responsible for that, and you're the guy that knew this guy that did this and this deal, and you're the responsible." I said, "You know what? What would it take for you to come work with me? Like, you know, how can I have you on my side?" <clears throat> and me and him have a good relationship as well. We've been together ever since then. Just we work on certain stuff. I, you know, again, I, it's not he's not a guy that's involved in my operations every single day. He doesn't deal with my fighters at all. It's really just me and him, and it's when you know when something comes up when we need it, and that's really what it is. And he's a he's a phenomenal guy, and you're right. I mean, it's just it's one of those relationships that goes way back, and you know. Yeah, he he sounds like a a very interesting that that uh, that I thought. Yeah, he sounds like Hello? a great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, you keep, you keep coming in. And yeah, you keep coming in and out. Dude, listen, you need to get your, your, your producer, and you need to tell him to get you better equipment because yeah. it's unbelievable that you're on a landline and it sounds this horrible. No, it's, a, it's actually Skype, Malky. Whatever the hell you're doing, dude, but you need, to, you need to get it right. You and your producer on this Mickey Mouse show of yours, get it right because guys, we I mean, don't have time to keep saying, hello, hello, are you there? I mean, it, this is ridiculous. Well, Which, by the way, let me also, let me also, let me also... Let me also let me also just make sure I correct something because I listened to your podcast from last week. A number one, I smacked the shit out of Buster Lane in front of everybody in the lobby <laughs> three different times. I do. Okay, you know that, and I know that. The fact that you walked in there, I didn't know who you were. You're right, and you got bottled up by one of my guys. Remember, there was like twenty guys there. Yeah, who another getting bottled up. Well, another you don't, juice. You don't, you don't want to. You don't talk about that. Hold on, you don't want to talk about that part. You got bottled up. And Bloodstain Lane got bottled up. Not only that, do you forget that I also threw a punch down the pipe when we decided to go Muay Thai and he decided to quit? Oh, my stomach hurts. I'm about to throw up. Listen, I didn't lose anything in that. I beat him the whole time. You were going to get beat up, beaten up too, but you decided to go with my guys and you got bottled up fast. It was bad. You know what I mean? But you and him both left there upset. Both of you decided to tag team me after that for like uh, almost a year until you guys finally decided to stop because I just ran into you guys everywhere. And after a while, enough was enough. Um, you want to tell that story? You want to and- you huh? tell that story? The the UFC in in Houston. You walk up to me with John Jones. No, I don't walk up. Left, Frank no, 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 no. I don't walk up. Come on, hold on. I don't walk up to you. If you remember correctly, you're walking up the stairs. You got two beers in your hand because we know the FRB <laughs> likes to have a cold beer. And I'm walking down the stairs with John and and Frank. Now, mind you, these are guys that you and Bless Lane at the time have talked about how tweeted about news the day that it was going to just go down. And you put both beers down, you looked up, and you were scared. And I said, bro, relax. Nothing's going to happen to you. Do you not remember? No, I remember. But I put the beers down because I was like, I, what was I going to do, run? But you couldn't. You were, gonna get, you, were gonna, you were screwed. But I held them both back. I told them both to relax. They both kind of patted you on the ass for you to get, get on your, your way. And that was into that story, bro. They just, you know, one patted you on the head, if I remember correctly. The other one patted you on the ass and said, keep moving. Don't talk shit about me anymore. And I don't think you did after that. That was it. Yeah, but I mean, if you're gonna see, here's the thing. Here's the thing about you. I'll if actually show up. And be one of these insiders. If you're gonna be an insider, you have to tell the truth. You can't just make shit up. I didn't make shit up, dude. You made shit up. That whole last week's podcast. I mean, it, it was. Uh, come on, you make shit up. The bottom line is, is this. Is well, when you and, I, I gotta give it. When you and Bloodstain Lane, let me let, let me just get this in. When you and Bloodstain Lane, the first match you went at, which w- you only agreed to one match. That was. And he really Do you even remember what happened? Do you even remember what happened? Well, you didn't. It was like very you I do remember for- correctly. We were going at it. And I was messing around with him the whole time. I was playing with him. And he catches me in something. And I'm like, all right, all right, time out. Let's go for real. And we went for real. He couldn't even do anything. That's the third time around. We were both exhausted. But I beat him the third time around, too, because I controlled him the whole time. I got him in, like, what, three different um, submissions that I slipped out because we were sweaty. You don't remember? I mean, I was beating him up left and right. Not the first match. Not the thing um, the first match the first match was like 10 seconds do you remember it was yeah. quick and it was like dude what is this because because he choked no. you out he didn't choke me out that's a lie bro that's a lie come on that's a lie dude that's, that's why wanna... that's why you wanted the rematch it was only supposed no, to be it was, one it was the rematch we were playing around i thought let's, let's do it for real let's, let's go for real <laughs> no but that that was uh that was when john won the championship that was uh that was a fun time uh but yeah that's uh, ancient history, but it's still a good story. But the the reason why I wanted to... No, there's no, there's no good story. I have the video, by the way. I have the video. I have the video. All right. I have the video. So for the same thing, I have the video. 
And Bloodstain asked my, my guys to please not put it out there because Casper has it. And I asked for the video once, and then they said, listen, we promised them we wouldn't give it to you because we don't want you to embarrass about it. I said, all right, fine, the hell with it. So we have it. All right, well, you got the video. All right, you can hold it over his head. But the reason why I wanted you on here, you know, the most high-profile manager in the game, by far, I'll give you that, the Reebok deal. And I want to know what it means, in your expert opinion, what does this mean for the guys? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it just money coming from a different source? Well, listen, here's, here's the thing. Uh, the Reebok, if you remember when I did the John Jones deal with Nike almost two, two years and change ago, I told everybody, I said, guys, this is the beginning of what's going to soon to, to start to happen, which is the other guys are going to get in. Under Armour has always done something with, with, with uh, George in Canada. <clears throat> it was never a deal in North America. Anderson had something in Brazil. I think uh, Sexy Yama had something in Japan or, or, or Uno. Hell, Uno, I think. It was a Uno. I, I don't remember who was. Had something with Reebok, I think, out in uh, Japan or, or uh, Korea. They wanted to, right, so they had something out there. But no one had ever done anything globally and in North America. So when Nike finally did the, pulled the trigger on John, this was the first time that they, that any of these companies had done it in American, young American athlete, champion on top, on top of it all, the number one pound-for-pound pound guy in the sport, the way Nike did. And I said to everyone that, I, I don't remember if it was on Damon Martin's show or on your buddy Ariel Hawani's show or what, but I said to everyone that, uh, that with this Nike deal, watch Adidas, watch Water. I guarantee you that they're going to end up coming in now and you're going to see more and more fighters get these deals <clears throat> because a lot of this stuff just happens to be watch one guy do it and then the rest kind of just start to do it. And sure enough, Nike went to sign Dos Santos. Do you remember that? And then they went to sign Dos Santos. Then all of a sudden, right. pops up Reebok with Johnny Hendricks. And then, uh, if not even, if you, if you're right, I'm sorry, Johnny Hendricks, I think, and then Anthony Pettis, um, around that time, I think Johnny was the very first guy. They signed a deal with Reebok. And, I, and everything I was saying was happening. I didn't know how this, all this stuff works. And in those same interviews, I said that watch, because somebody asked me, can we ever see the swoosh take the cage? And I said, you know what? Give it a couple years. Within the next five years, I, I can bet you that if it's not Nike, one of those, one of those companies is going to be in MMA and is going to be in MMA heavy. And it just made a lot of sense. Now, a lot of people were like, well, why would a shoe company care about MMA? And what if you really look at a lot of these companies, some of their biggest business is compression. And when you look at our sport, what's our biggest use, what's our biggest equipment outside of the, the gloves and all that, it's compression. So they're, and then also on top of it, running is big for every one of these companies, Under Armour, Adidas, Nike, Reebok, it's all running. Every one of them, their biggest, some of their biggest businesses is running. So if you're not Nike, outside of Nike, right, everybody else's business is, is training. So Nike's biggest business is obviously basketball and training. So I knew that when they were going to, they said to me, we're going to put John in the training aspect, because that's the category he's still under, because they didn't create a, a combat sports division for it. <coughs> I said, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. And people would ask me, these, these guys who interviewed me were asking me, can we ever see them in the octagon? I said, it's just a matter of time before what happens. This deal is going to trigger that, because somebody's going to see it and say, well, wait a minute, if Nike has them, how do we get in there, block Nike, and, say, and that's how those big corporations work. And it was just a matter of time. And then one day I see a tweet from Dana saying that, um, the current marketing office, chief marketing officer, is the bad thing. So stuff about that. And then there was these rumors about Under Armour and Nike and this and that. I think that you know there was a negotiation between all the companies, and Reebok ends up getting it. So this is something that I've always known. Now, when you look at John and you look at John's sponsorship, you notice that every single company he has is outside the octagon, except for EA Sports, which is an EA, which is a UFC uh, affiliate. So <laughs> I've been preparing and prepping for this for a long time. Uh, when it came to John. Now, a lot of people are like, well, what does this mean, sponsor-wise, this, that, the other? Well, when you look at the NFL, you look at basketball, you look at baseball, this is something that I told people back when the deal happened. I said to them, stop thinking that just because Nike sponsors the NFL, every guy has a Nike deal. Every guy doesn't have a Nike deal. Every guy has to wear Nike. The league has a deal. People didn't understand me back then. I said the same thing about basketball. I said, no, the thing with basketball is, people don't know, but LeBron, when he was at the Heat, had to wear Adidas. Adidas had the on-court apparel. So an official LeBron jersey isn't made by Nike. It's made by Adidas. At least when he was here with the, with the, uh, with the Heat. But they negotiated, the players did, and the unions did, for the players to be able to wear their own shoes. This allowed for them to have those massive you know, shoe deals. But 
again, the only guys who have shoe deals in all of I mean, if you look at uh, the news recently about Kyrie Irving having a deal with Nike, it's, it's Durant, uh, LeBron, and Kyrie Irving, Kobe. That's about it. Nobody else has their own real shoe deal. And the ones who do don't get paid <coughs> millions and millions of dollars. So there's a lot of this big fantasy. Like, oh, you know, once Nike came in there, they were going to pay John $50 million here, and they were going to do all this and that. And that's not how it works. So now this Reebok deal came through. The interesting thing about it is that every single guy will get paid for wearing Reebok. Whereas in the other sports, it's a, depending on how much they're getting paid, how much, you know, then they divide it amongst, amongst the players, depending on whatever portion the players got. And, and if you were the star, let's just, so let's say if you're LeBron and your jersey sells more than everybody, then you got paid a little bit more than everybody else. So if you were Kevin Durant, then, you know, you get, if you hear this, depending on where you're at, you're going to get paid a certain amount no matter what. Or if other sponsorships are gone. Now, the only issue, so then, you know, again, people have been asking my opinion on it. I can't give an opinion on the Reebok deal until I see the numbers, until I know what each level is going to get. What's the champion going to get? What's the Carlos Condit going to get? Because I know how much Carlos Condit was making. He was making good money, you know what I mean, uh, throughout all his sponsorship. Because, see, people are looking at it like, well, now goes away dethrone, goes away Hayabusa, goes away tap out, whatever. <clears throat> and those guys weren't paying anybody hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Well, I understand that. But when you take away those companies and then take away training masks and take away dynamic fastener and take away one law and muscle farm and every other company that's where now you're looking at it being a little different so if my guy who's on a main card somewhere first fight of the night of the main card uh not ranked in the top 10 but it's an exciting fighter you know whatever guy you want to pick off my roster um i give you a perfect example if a guy like ben henderson is right he's not in the top five he's like number seven former champion though so he's going to get paid a certain number being at number seven compared to if he was in the top five, compared to if he was the champion. But his deals that I have for him now set up aren't based on all that. You follow where I'm coming from? So yeah. he's a guy that makes six figures. Does that mean now in three fights a year he'll make six figures with this Reebok deal? Do you understand where I'm coming from? That's where i got to sit down and look. I have a feeling that it's going to be bad for the guys at the top of the food chain, and it's going to be great for the guys at the very bottom of the food chain. And that's where we have to look at it and then analyze it from there. Is it a perfect system? Probably not. Is it going to be perfect? Who knows? But I just with these type of things, I know it takes a lot of time, and there's got to be a work in progress. So we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out as it as it uh, as it goes along. You make a good point. It's something that that I've said, and I think I ripped it off somebody. They said the guys at the bottom of the card get paid too much, and the guys at the at the top of the card don't get paid enough because those guys making eight and eight, ten and ten on the fight pass prelims. How many tickets did they sell? How many? You know, how many uh, pay-per-views, you know, or obviously they're not on pay-per-view, but, you know, what did they contribute to the success of the show? Were they, did they... Right, and then, you know, this is, Brian, you bring up a good point, because when people talk to me about, oh, there's got to be unions, there's got to be this, I keep saying to people, well, okay, let's, let's just say that we, we all agree that there needs to be a union. What are we going to fight for? Are we fighting for the John Joneses that are supposed to be getting paid maybe a couple million dollars more? Or are we fighting for the guy at the very bottom of the cart so he can get paid you know, more at the bottom of the card. And the reality of it is, is that when I look at the way it's set up, <clears throat> and when you compare it to boxing, see, people, this is the thing that, you know, they make this comparison of boxing. And they look at what Floyd Mayweather makes, look at what a Pacquiao makes. And Pacquiao's not drawing that, he didn't draw that much of the last card. He made this, this you know, big amount of money. People don't realize there's only like three or four guys in all of boxing that are making that type of money, right? Three or four tops, maybe two tops, to be honest with you, for a long time. Everybody else in the card is pretty much drowning and suffering. It's, so the UFC kind of, Gives you more. The minute you make it to the UFC, right, you're making more money than a boxer makes at your level coming in, depending on how many fights you have. Because most boxers, if they got 20, 30 fights and they're winning fights, they're going to go up and pay. They'll be up in the, you know, a couple hundred thousand, whereas in the UFC, it might not be. But at this point, a guy will pretty much have been promoted and, it's been, you know, they're, they're selling, they can sell tickets off the guy, whatever it might be. In the UFC, a guy coming in at 8 and 8, 10 and 10 is making more money than your average boxer. Middle of the pack fighter, making 25 and 25, 40 and 40, is making more than your middle of the pack boxer. Where the difference is, is the guys who are fighting on the main cards of these events and the guys who are like in the in, you know, co-main events, guys who are champions, former champions, that's where the problem comes in to me, in my mind, for the UFC. Nobody has ever shown me a formula that makes sense. Nobody has ever given me a, uh, an idea of a way to sit there and un to unilaterally give it some sort of deal. One thing I like about this Reebok thing is that if it works out in this tiered system, that might be the model to use on pay stuff. Well, if, you know, if you're ranked in the soul, so then this is what you should be getting paid. And if you're, getting, you know, if you're a champion, then you should be getting getting X, Y, Z piece of the cut and this type of base pay. I mean, it, might, it might be a way to work certain things out. We don't know. The, 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 the way the pay is in, in the UFC, it's all negotiable. That's the good thing about it. 
And that's where, you know, I like to keep it. You know what I mean? If you go to like a unionized thing, then there's minimums, but then there's also maximums and then you're kind of stuck. So whereas here, <laughs> at least you're looking at the fact that I can go in and negotiate a deal. You know, this XYZ guy stepping in short notice, you need him to do this, that we can negotiate a, a payment for that. If a guy is a champion, you know what I mean, comes out of his contract, is a, is a free agent or one fight left on his contract, you can negotiate something, you know, spectacular. I mean, these are the type of things that, that you know, we should be happy that we have. I just think that there's other things that we can look at. Pension plans, you know what I mean, uh, daily health insurance, things of that nature that I would like to see the UFC do. But I will give them credit where it's due. They are the first, you know, combat organization to ever give, you know, health insurance to the guys that get hurt while they're training or uh, <coughs> in a fight. And for a lot of my fighters, man, that's been, a, that's been a huge help. You know what I mean? So there's other things that I'd like to see get done besides just, you know, complaining about pay. But you make a good point. Guys on the very bottom of the card absolutely add nothing to the card other than this is their opportunity for the UFC to continue to build them and help them get to a certain point. And when they get to that point, they're supposed to be rewarded and paid. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. But again, you know, I look at it like this. It's the same thing with me. If one of my guys is underpaid, it's my fault. I'm the one who negotiated that contract. And if the UFC got me, they got me. And if one of my guys is overpaid, you know what I mean, and I got the UFC, then I got them. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Then that's, that's the plus for me. And that's something that people don't understand. This is all a negotiation. And a lot of guys don't get into it. They don't like to. And I understand the UFC is rough and they're tough and all that. But, I mean, it's a business and you can do whatever you need to do. Sure. And, you know, another thing that would affect you as a manager, you know, who's uh, managed a lot of champions is the lack of a true free agency for, for guys under contract to the UFC. There, there is no free agency. It's not like uh, Albert Pujols a couple years ago. He was able to talk to 29 other teams and he got $260 million from the Angels. John Jones has got a champion's clause or Ben Henderson had a champion's clause. And he can just continue to uh, exercise options or these matching rights. It can never get away. I mean, do you ever see some of those? Yeah, but listen, I mean, listen, listen, here's the thing. But here's the thing. If a guy gets to the end of his contract and is allowed to go out and shop his contract, right, and shop a deal, and let's say Bellator comes back and says, hey, we're going to give you $20 million plus pay-per-view guaranteed on every one of your fights, right? And the UFC has a right to match it. If you go out and you get the best, contract out there, possibly out there. You go out and you go to World Series of Fighting and to 1FC and this and that, and you get the best numbers out there, right? And you come back to them and say, well, here's the contract that they're giving up to us, right? And they're willing to match it, but so who cares? If you follow where I'm coming from, then who, who really cares? If you're looking just for about the money aspect of it, then who cares? Now, if you're one of these guys that's disgruntled and you're unhappy with them and you want to leave, then now you're looking at hoping, hoping that they'll cut you or release you because you're not happy with them. You follow where I'm coming from? But as far as like having a real, when they sit there and say, yeah, you're right, we don't have 29 other leagues to go to. Right now, you have one, maybe two, depending on who the guy is. You know what I mean? I, I doubt that I can listen. I'll put it like this. If John Jones became a free agent today, who is he going to go to? I mean, the only option would realistically be, be Bellator. You know what I mean? They'd probably be the only one to afford him. If I went to World Series of Fighting, they couldn't afford what he's getting paid right now, no matter what, what it was. And, and then you got to understand long term viability. That's not something that, that's probably there with those guys. You know what I mean? I don't know that they would be able to afford to pay him just millions and millions of dollars every single time they still put him on two, two, two to three times a year. If I want to from, so there's a lot of different things that go into it. People are like, oh, there's no this and there's no that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I, you just need to have someone willing to offer more and pay a guy more. You've got to be willing to go down that route. You've got to also understand, too, Brian, the, the other problem here is that a lot of fighters don't even look anywhere else. This is the stage they want to be on. It, 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 listen, it kind of comes down to, like, in the other sports, when you look at a lot of times when a guy signs with Nike as opposed to an Adidas or a Reebok or a Puma or uh, whoever, right? It's usually because they like the brand. They like the lifestyle end of it. They want to wear Jordan and this, that, and the other. Because if you go sign with Puma, you can't wear it. So they go with, with Nike for a lot less. Nike knows that they have that brand power within the athletes. So that's why you'll see a lot of guys, you know, have Nike. When Nike's the, the, the least amount of it. I'll give you an example. I had a guy once uh, in football who got offered $75,000 from Adidas to wear Adidas cleats. Nike came in and said, I'll give you 30000 in, in product. He took the 30000 in product because he loves to wear Jordans. This is the way it goes. You follow where I'm coming from? So it's the same thing. So UFC comes in and says, hey, with the UFC, a lot of guys, because of their brand power, want to be involved with the UFC. That's where, you know, supposedly the best of the best are. That's where you get to, to test yourself against what's supposedly the best of the best. <clears throat> and then you get in there, and, you know, then you want to cry and complain about money. Well, I mean, the reality of it is if you want to get paid more, you might have a better opportunity somewhere else getting paid more, depending on what level you're at and who you are. So there's a lot of different things that have to all – every situation is different and unique. You understand what I'm saying to you? And that's the thing that a lot of guys don't get. That's the problem with this sport. There isn't, 
you can't just take the cookie cutter and say, here's what it is. I'm hoping that one day we can maybe get something negotiated for the fighters as a whole. And, and you know, there's, there's some sort of collective bargaining where, you know, the fighters' voice is heard in a lot of these negotiations and stuff. But for the most part, what's good for John Jones is not good for Bruce Leroy. What's good for a Chris Weidman is not good for a, you know, an Eddie Gordon, for example. You understand? Or a, a, a uh, Leoto Machida. And that's where it gets a little tricky. So how you got to ask those guys at the very top of the food chain to give up a bunch for the guys at the very bottom. You got a guy like Nate Diaz. He wanted his deal redone. How often does that happen? You know, or do you need to be John Jones to to get your deal reworked if you had three or four fights left? Well, I mean, here's the thing. I think I think you you yeah. I think you have to be. Uh, I think you have to ha- you have to be somebody. A position to be able to ask for it. You can't just jump up and say, I'm not doing this anymore because the UFC doesn't really need a lot of guys. Do they need a Ronda Rousey? Yes. A John Jones? Yes. Anderson? Yes. A Brock Lesnar? Yes. A CM Punk? Yes. I think a lot of these guys, they're going to need them in some, some way, some fashion to keep their, their pay-per-view business good and strong and their star power, you know, amongst the, the, the casuals to beat it. You follow me? So a guy like Nate, who we all love, hardcore love him, but the reality of it is you're not selling pay-per-views with Nate. You're not really moving the needle per se. Or, I mean, and let me let me stop. He's a guy that people watch and they'll see and they'll talk about and they, they get the media, you know, hyped up and riled up. <coughs> but there was a difference between Nate and Nick. Nick was obviously more of a uh, he has more star power. So it was a lot easier for Nick to just to sit out and wait and wait and wait and then out hey, if I'm gonna do anything I'm gonna fight Anderson. And that's why they make those type of deals. There's certain guys that can do stuff like that and others can't. And it just all comes down to leverage. I mean, there's boxers out there who can sit there and say, Look, I'm not fighting. I'm gonna look at look at Floyd and, and Manny. I mean, Floyd can say and do whatever he wants. The other fighters can't do that. You understand where I'm coming from? And it's just, it's just the way it goes. You know what I mean? It's unfortunate. It may not be fair, but that's just the way it is. You know, I got fighters on my roster that sometimes things get put to them that's just not necessarily fair, and they really don't have a choice. You know what I mean? Because they, their other option is to maybe get cut, and then you know, they'll be somewhere else, and there's just nothing for them at that point. Whereas there's other guys on my uh, uh, roster who will say no, and say, I don't feel that, don't like that, don't want that, and things get adjusted and changed uh, for them. But that's in everything. That's in every single sport. Right. Tom Brady doesn't get treated the same way as a defensive lineman, uh, a second or third round defensive lineman, or, or, or their first round pick. Chandler Jones is a first round pick. John's brother. They treat Tom Brady different than they do Chandler Jones, and Chandler's a fucking star. You get where I'm coming from? Yeah. So the reality of it is, is that it's not, it's not, it's not a. Uh, it's just, it's just it's the world that we live in, and it's just the way it is when it comes to athletics. Now, I, I got a couple things for you. I'll get you out of here. Thanks for the time. Uh, the guys who are in the top tier for that Reebok or. They have I, – I don't know if I understand this completely. A guy like John Jones, does he have a Reebok deal outside of the, the UFC Reebok deal, or is it a deal within the UFC Reebok deal, if that makes any sense? Well, we're, we're working on a deal outside of uh, the deal with, with, with different companies. We're not really allowed to talk about what's going on and what we have yet, so just stay tuned. In a couple of weeks, we're going to announce a, uh, a uh, shoe and clothing deal for John. And um, it, it would be something completely separate than whatever is going on inside the octagon. So, but, so but a, uh, it's possible, though, he would be required to wear Reebok in the cage, but outside the cage, he could. Everyone, wear- everyone is required. Everybody from now on is required to wear uh, Reebok in the cage. It's, it's how it is in every other sport. See, this is the one thing I want everybody to understand. For years, everybody said they wanted MMA to be like NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball. Okay. Yes. And now you guys get this one part when it comes to the uniform. What I don't understand is why everybody's all up in arms about it. Until we see the numbers, you really can't say much about it. This is a good thing for us. It's going to make it look more uniform. It's going to make it look cleaner, nicer, better. And this is an opportunity to really improve the look of MMA. Now, my gripe with the whole thing is our, you know, our voices as a, as a group, as a, as a, as a team, as, a, as the fighters themselves, wasn't necessarily there. They just went negotiating the deal, and then supposedly all the money is going to be given back to the fighters. Well, what if you come find out one day, like, what if Ben Henderson was to find out that he's getting paid the same as, you know, guys in the ranked three spots or above him or four spots above him that he's beaten? Or three spots below him that he's only making, like, two grand left. You understand? There are some issues there. But, again, I think the system is something that, that will get it worked out as time goes on. I think they'll have to put something out there, and then, you know, the fighters will say something, and then they'll go back and forth. So that's the only issue with the whole thing. But you understand where I'm coming from? The reality of it is that nobody's going to be allowed to wear anything but sweet box in the octagon. It's the same thing in the NFL. Everybody has to wear Nike. But there's guys like look, Peyton Manning last year was sponsored by Reebok. So he wore Reebok cleats and covered up the Reebok logo. 
Mm. You, you understand where I'm coming from? And this is how it works. Now, it's the same thing with, uh, with LeBron. LeBron is a Gatorade Powerade athlete. You understand? So when he's on the sidelines, but they have Gatorade that, they, uh, that, they, uh, that the league is sponsored by. So he has to drink Powerade in the Gatorade cup or Powerade, you know what I mean, in a Gatorade bottle. So that, or, you understand what I'm trying to yeah. You understand what I'm saying? You, like, yeah. you can't be seen drinking Powerade on the sidelines. And that's well, LeBron James, probably the most powerful you know, athlete in, in all the sports. You brought up something previous about Ben Henderson maybe being ranked seventh. I don't know off the top of my head. But I think another thing that needs to be put in there about the sponsorships and what tier you're in is your name recognition. Maybe Ben's lost a couple well, I of agree. Fights. I agree. I think, I think, I think it's, it's bullshit that a guy like Ben can drop the numbers. First of all, the media ranking should have no, 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 no part in this, in this thing anyway. I don't think the media members that, that, uh, you know, that are, are doing this now are the ones who should be doing it. That, that I'm going to tell you. <laughs> right off the bat. I don't think that there's going to, you know, I don't think it's an ethics thing because <laughs> ever since the media rankings came out before, I never really, I haven't even spoken to the media in like a year and change realistically. So I haven't really dealt with a lot of the voting members or I never asked anybody to rank anybody. So I don't think that would really go on if other managers are doing that. And then, you know, more power to them, whatever. Um, but this media rankings thing to me is kind of crazy. You know, Ben Henderson to me is still one of the top five lightweights in, in the sport, he's going to go down as one of the best ever. He has the record tied with BJ Penn for the most title defenses. Um, should Anthony Pettis be getting paid more than Ben Henderson today? Um, and all his, uh, absolutely, I think so. I think Ben Anthony Pettis is a champ. He deserves to get paid. But then after that, you call him Cabo shouldn't get paid. No, does that mean Ben should get paid less? I don't think so. But should I should Ben get paid more than a Miles Jury? Should Ben get paid more than most guys in the top five that don't have the same you know analytics as him? I, I think so. Yeah. Are you going to tell me that those Anjos who beat Ben have bigger name quality and name recognition than Ben Henderson? No. no. You follow me? And if, if you're a sponsor and endorser, who do you choose? Those Anjos from Brazil or Ben Henderson that's an American? Do you, you get where I'm coming from? And so if, if you had to choose, and, and that's a perfect example I guess I could give you. Khabib Nurmagomedov, Russian guy, great, phenomenal fighter. Love him. Right? I think he's awesome. Number one guy in the world right now, number one contender. So if you're Reebok and you have to choose a guy for the, to be the face of your company, and I gave you Ben Henderson or Khabib. Those are your only two options. Who do you pick? Well, be Ben Henderson, right? Ben Henderson, yeah. So, so then you know, understand. But, but in this setup, but in this setup, Ben Henderson would get paid less than a Khabib, and that's where I'm trying to tell you that I agree with you that name value, name recognition, being a champion, former champion, things of that nature should take into a fact. But again, again, this is us speculating. We're jumping the gun. I don't know what it's going to look like. You don't really know what this system is going to be of. Um, <clears throat> it could be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because there's some facts in this thing that is pretty good. A, number one, you have all your stuff done. You no longer have to worry about shorts and banners and all sorts of crap. So that's, that's, that's done. Second thing is, is that you now get paid within 10 days. So you no longer have to wait and chase a sponsor down for a measly 500 bucks. This frees up the time for your managers. Instead of to sit around and have to do all this crazy shit, to go out there now and really work deals and try to get real deals done. And that to me is very important. Makes sense. Two quick ones before I let you go. Give us a quick update on Carlos Condit when he's coming back and your general thoughts about CM Punk. Carlos Condit should be back um, probably end of February, March, I would say. So he's, he's, uh, he's on pace to come back. Uh, my thoughts on CM Punk. You know, I like CM Punk. I like CM Punk a lot as a, as a fan of WWE. I met CM Punk. He's cool. Um, he had a lot of shit to say about John when John got the DUI. So that's why, you know, I tweeted some shit out and John tweeted some stuff out and you know, we, we found it uh, uh, interesting that the UFC would go down this route. I, you know, from a business standpoint, I, I kind of like the idea of CM Punk being uh, in the UFC because this is going to allow the casuals and maybe fans, guys out there who aren't fans of the UFC, to come and look. I think it's important to get something that makes attracts people to the sport. If CM Punk is that guy, then great. If he's not, then this was the biggest mistake ever. I, 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 I'm happy for him. I think it's awesome. I think he, he has enough name value. I mean, I don't know if any fighter that has more followers on Twitter or Facebook or, or Instagram than CM Punk. You know what I mean? So he's definitely a big, big star. He's got a huge following. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see who they match him up with and, you know, who he fights right off the bat. Because this is, this is not a sport where you can just come in there and do it like that. You follow me? But <clears throat> one thing about him, the guy works hard, he trains hard, and I think that he's somebody that, you know, can come in and maybe win a fighter. But, you know, I'm happy for him. I'm happy he got an opportunity. I'm happy he gets a shot. Um, will it work out? I don't know. No, I doubt it, to be honest with you. But the first two or three fights might bring a lot of, uh, of, of his fans over. And if it does that, you know, then hope that you're on his card because that card will probably do very well and there'll be some new fans created. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure uh, there's going to be a manager trying to get his top guy on the same card as CM Punk's debut fight. They might have to headline on CM Punk. CM Punk may have to headline, bro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't see how CM Punk put the on the card. I can't imagine John Jones being the main event and CM Punk being like a co-main event. It's, I, I don't know how that would work. You know what I mean? I don't know how much they pay him. I gotta assume it's it's up there, but like I, I that that that'd be a card that I think would do great numbers, but it'd cost them a lot. You know what I mean? So it just depends. Absolutely. All right. You know, now, it, it'll probably be it'll probably be CM Punk and Ronda. You know what I mean? It'll probably be CM Punk uh, main event Ronda co-main. Yeah. Uh, so. Well. All right, Malky, I, uh, I appreciate the time, man, and, and the insight from the uh, most well-known and best, I'll give you that, manager or agent in, in the game, and now going to the NFL. So good luck with that uh, new venture, and uh, hope to talk to you soon, man. All right, cool. Thanks, brother. Later. Be good. Appreciate it. All right, bye, buddy. Welcome back to the FRB show. We got another special guest. He is a four-time NCAA finalist, a two-time national champion, two-time Hodge Trophy winner, an Olympian, the best damn welterweight in the world. And if you don't believe him, just ask him, Ben Askren. What's going on, Mike? Man, uh, not much. I'm just sitting out here watching the Packers game. They're kicking butt and taking names like usual. So, uh, got to say it's a good night. <laughs> good, good. So, tell me, uh, on, on Saturday, Lawler, um, Johnny Hendricks, too, did, did they get the scoring right? How did you score it? I will tell you honestly, um, Anthony won his fight at the corner. We went backstage. I said, congratulations, Anthony, and uh, I headed for the airport because I had a red-eye flight. I thought we were going to uh, we're expanding our original wrestling academy in Wisconsin, and I thought I needed to be back, and then actually I didn't, but I already had the red-eye book, so I just stuck with it. Um, so I got to say, I honestly did not watch that fight. I will tell you, following my Twitter feed, I sure thought Johnny Hendricks won the fight, following my Twitter feed. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of... <laughs> I think I saw MMADecisions.com had a poll of media members and maybe like 56% thought that Hendricks actually won. Or It's possible I, I read it wrong and it was 56%, uh, you know, um, Lawler won. I, I, I can't remember. You know, I didn't actually get to see the fight either. I, hey, I was taking where were you? Drinking beers at the bus store? <laughs> you know, I was actually I was actually down at uh at Twin Peaks and wow. uh yeah down at by uh Planet Hollywood so I didn't get to see it either because people <laughs> people were bothering me about another guy and I actually I got a message uh, I'll tell you off air who I got this from was very upset about some of your comments about professional wrestling and CM Punk <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's okay. I've, I've never been afraid to ruffle a few feathers here and there. And, you know, my comments usually tend to make someone a little bit upset. So, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, you, you have this talent of, uh, of getting under people's skin. And uh, you, you're very good at it. And, obviously, you're under Johnny Hendrick's skin. And, uh, and, yeah. and another, guy, uh, another guy is, uh, is Dana White. Yeah, Definitely under his skin for sure. Now, now I, I I see a lot uh, saying, "Oh, you know, you, you know, you, you haven't beaten this guy or you haven't fought this guy." I, I don't think people understand it, it. It's a personal vendetta why you don't fight there. Is that yeah, is that well, a fear? And, and when it comes down to you know people people want to discredit my record, but they always they always forget when. I, you know, I steal people's souls, Front Row Brian. Uh, when I fought Dan Hornbuckle, he was ranked number 12 in the world. When I fought Jay Haran, he was ranked number 15. Uh, and, you know, Lima, I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't quite steal his soul because he's still pretty damn good afterwards, but he was ranked number 16 when I fought him. So, you know, a lot of these guys were ranked fairly highly in the world when I fought them. Um, and a lot of these guys I fought when I was a, a baby in mixed martial arts. I mean, I won the Bellator title 18 months after I started fighting. So, um 
you know, I think a lot of easy to discredit, and, and, and Dana, obviously, he's just been proving the fool with the CM Punk signing, because his main reason for not signing me was I didn't have enough experience, which is, uh, at this point, laughable. You see, I, I don't really understand it, because, you know, I, I had talked to people, you know, behind the scenes and stuff, and they said they just don't like that guy's attitude. He's like, basically... <laughs> Basically, it's like, who does he think he is talking about George St. Pierre? This is, you know, when you were still under contract with yeah, Bellator. Yeah. And did, did you ever get that sense? Or have you had people tell you that? Um, I mean, I get that vibe. But honestly, the, the biggest thing I think in the, in the UFC thing, uh, for me, what I came up with, that I would come from Bellator and Bjorn uh, rub people the wrong way, the way he talked about me was, that was the biggest thing that I found. And I just, obviously, I came at the wrong time because, you know, Hector got a big paycheck because they thought they were stealing away. And then Eddie was still kind of fought over. And then when I was coming up, that was kind of when Bellator was really gaining some momentum, really gaining some credibility. And uh, that's what I got out of it. Yeah. I, I, I was like, you know, from what I heard, you know, they were upset that you were going after you know, accusations about performance enhancing drugs. And, you know, I'm like, well, Tim Kennedy's talking about them every day. He, he still has a job. But it, it yep. just seems that, it, like, things that you said just seem to really get to them. Whereas if somebody else said it, they, they'd say, oh, they're, they're being uh, funny or, you know, they're, they're like the, the, uh, the Irish fella who, the only man in America who tweets about having two, 50 year old best friends 24 7. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, a few other people say it, but I don't think a lot of people go to the extent that I go to. And that's just kind of my personality. I've never been afraid to say what I feel or what I think or, or what the truth is, for that matter. Um, so I kind of have been more vocal than people. But at the end of the day, um, one man shouldn't hold a personal vendetta because when the company's motto is, we are the best fighters in the world, and when it's obvious that they don't at this point, um, you know, that kind of starts to hurt the company. And that, I, that's kind of how I felt about this CM Punk thing, and I, I understand the, the monetary value in the short term, but when it kind of takes away from your company's core values, I think that hurts credibility a lot. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up CM Punk because he lives only about 90 miles from, from Duke's gym, you know, where, where you've made your home these all these years and uh, from the interviews i've heard i've heard him mention duke in almost every yeah, one of them yeah. multiple times so i i think you might actually have a new teammate there yeah and if i've heard that rumor too that he's uh that he's gonna probably come up here and train it's a smart move i mean at this point we're the one of the hottest gyms in america um you know anthony has retained his title we got rick glenn this weekend fight for world to the fighting title and Obviously, a lot of people, after seeing what I tweet, they said, well, why, you know, obviously I have something against this, against this guy, but I don't have anything against the guy. The guy, the guy CM Punk, he's uh, taking those opportunities and making the best of it. It was more the organization that made that decision was, uh, in my opinion, making, making silly decisions. So, uh, Phil Brooks, a.k.a. CM Punk, w walks in the gym. There, there's not going to be a an issue there you'll you'll welcome him and uh yeah I'll, because i help coach him i'll train him whatever it's so, yeah i mean i don't have anything against the guy i don't see i my statement was to the ufc not to see him punk unless he takes uh umbrage to what i said but you know there's not really much he can say he's a zero and zero mma fighter who's 36 years old and has no real combat sports background yeah, I mean, it sounded like he definitely has respect for you. I, in one of the interviews with Ariel, he or or Megan Olivia, I forget which one, but he specifically mentioned you. Cool. Yeah. So hopefully, I get new teammates. Be a, always like new guys to train with. For sure. For sure. So, CM Punk. Uh, also, like related to uh, to the fights on Saturday. You know, you of course uh, were there to support your teammate. Anthony Pettis, who uh, just was spectacular. So just talk a little bit about, uh, about Anthony Pettis. And can, can he beat Nurogomedkov? Oh, well, 100%. Um, you know, 
I mean, Nero Megamedov, obviously, he has uh, he has good wrestling, but I don't think he's as well-rounded as Gil was. I mean, Gil's a very underrated striker. He's got great jiu-jitsu and uses his wrestling really well. So obviously, uh, Nero Megamedov has good wrestling, but I don't think his jiu-jitsu or his striking is at the level of Gil's was. Uh, Anthony's just so di- uh, he's so di- dynamic, and he does so much damage with his strike. Uh, it's going to be really hard for anyone to stop him at this point because his wrestling is just, Obviously, you know, people People always brought the Clay Guida match, and obviously he's improved leaps and bounds since then, and uh, he's only getting better and better all the time. Yeah, I, I think if there's a guy that's that's going to beat Pettis soon, it, it would be uh, Neurogomedkov. He seems to be able to, yeah. to rap doll guys. Yeah, you know, he, he's obviously got the strong wrestling, which we're going to get right back to work on that. And then, you know, the only one in that division that really poses any – uh, interest to me past that because I think, you know, Nate Diaz, I think that's an easy win for Anthony. Um, and a few of those other guys is uh, Rafael Dos Anjos who fights this week. And I, I think that's, uh, he's obviously, he's kind of a dark horse. He's a tough guy, takes a good shot. So that, you know, that's a fight we're going to prepare for also. Getting getting back to, um, to the Hendricks-Lawler uh, situation, where do you see that going? you think they'll go to a rubber match or – they put in Rory McDonald in there. Yeah. Well, I think I think they'll probably come down to how their pay-per-view sales were this weekend. If they were good, they'll probably go with the rubber match. If they were terrible, it probably tells them no one really cares that much and they'll move on to the next contender. But, uh, you know, when Dana talks about moving the needle, I don't really know that there's anyone up there, Rory or otherwise, that can move the needle too much. Maybe, maybe Nick Diaz, possibly. People still have a lot of interest in him. But uh, other than that, Barring a George St. Pierre comeback, I don't think you have too many really, really super exciting matches. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder about GSP. I mean, it, it, so much, so much head trauma. Like some crazy stat. Like he's gotten hit more times in the last four fights than he did all the previous fights combined. Really? And wow. you can hear him even talk about it. And and he, he's it's in his head. You know, he's really concerned about the head trauma and. You know, well, shit. I, I, I don't blame him. It, it, it's his brain. Well, yeah, I, that's why. That's why I make a habit of not getting hit at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I always get a kick out of, um, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't like or, or appreciate your style of taking people down and and stomping a mud hole in them, then they can stop it. They, you're not in there against guys, you know, who are defenseless. Just stop yeah. it. Yeah. One grown man versus another grown man. And, and the best part about it is I tell them exactly what I'm going to do. So it's not like they have an idea, no idea what's coming. I just tell them I'm going to step in the cage. I'm going to come over there. I'm going to grab you. I'm going to throw you on the ground. And I'm going to beat you senseless. And, and they, they know what's coming. And they still they can't do anything about it. But so can't do anything you're, about it. You're under contract with 1FC, who's – you know, doing a lot of great things in Europe and, and, and now in the Middle East and uh, Asia, Asia. They're mostly in Asia. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it, Asia, <laughs> and then I meant uh, Dubai. Sure, but um, so I, I think when you signed with them, from what I read, it was a a two year contract for six fights, and the type of money was was pretty much in line with what a top guy in the UFC yeah. would make. Is that yeah? I mean, yeah, I'm definitely getting taken care of really well, um, treated really well, and really, it's a it's a great upcoming organization. Obviously, they do business a little different because they're uh, out of Asia, and just the Asian way of doing stuff is a little bit different. But uh, man, they're really coming up. It's really going to be exciting to see, especially you know, they're just going to China here in ten days. Uh, once that pops, it's really going to be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I I mean, uh, it's it's pretty. Amazing the uh, the cards. I, I think M1 Global just did a, a card in Beijing at uh, I think it's called the Mastercard Arena. It was where they played the basketball games in the the 08 Olympics. I don't. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't. Where where was the wrestling when when you were in the Olympics? Oh where, man, I can't even remember what it was called. They all had funny, you know, national national center for something or other. I can't remember exactly what it was called. Sure. Yeah, so I saw you. I saw you on Twitter. You wanted to fight in February in Jakarta. Is that is that still your goal? 
Yeah, I think there's a good chance that happened. I think that, I think I've heard. Uh, I think I saw read the February 14 shows in Jakarta. So hopefully Matt Hume, he's the matchmaker, hopefully he'll help me hook up on that show. That's why I that. You know, at this point, I'm 30 years old. I want to fight as often as possible, healthy, ready to rumble. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue with those fights, I mean, some of the guys that you, you fought, I, I haven't heard of. You know, I, and yeah. I'm sure you probably haven't heard of them. And, it, it, you know, I, I don't mean to, to criticize your record because, you know, I, I think you'd, you'd beat the, the top guys in the world. But, you know, yeah. like I said, you're 30, you're 30 years old. And I, I, um, I know you're one of the very few guys who are actually clean. You, you, you do this and you dominate without any help. No gear, no, no special stuff, and you know yeah. maybe that maybe that means that your your prime will be shorter than some of the guys out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not afraid to tell anybody. I think I'm past my physical prime. You know, that being said, I'm I still am moderately newer to the sport of the sport of folk style. Re- or, oh my gosh, I'm brain dead. The sport of mixed martial arts. So I'm still learning stuff. And uh, I'm still getting better, even though maybe I'm past my physical prime. Yeah, makes yeah, makes sense. Now with the with the one FC deal, you know, two years, uh, six fight minimum. I think it was. Is there some language in there that would allow you to leave for the UFC if they were to come to their senses? No, um, it's a, it's just a regular contract, but. I'm gonna go over there. I'm gonna beat everyone up, and at the end, you know, at the end of the day, I'll still only be 31 years old. So, so I can hold. And who knows? Maybe one of these gonna grow it an enormous amount by that point. They're gonna be bringing guys over to challenge me for the real world title that I have. Uh, but we'll see at that point. Right now, was it difficult? You know, this weekend because I knew you were very respectful for your teammate, and I, I, I was like, you know. It may, maybe he's being a little too respectful. Pettis, you know, he's getting enough attention, but um, uh, you really, you really didn't want to talk about yourself. The the focus was on was on Anthony. Yeah, I mean, this is Anthony's first fight in fifteen months. Um, he's making his comeback, and and you know how I felt was if I do something that's going to distract him from his having his team performance, and I'm not a good teammate and a good coach, so. I wanted to have no distractions for Anthony this weekend. I wanted to cause no trouble. Um, so this weekend was all about Anthony. And obviously, uh, you know, causing trouble or not, I think he's probably going to get the job done because he's just that damn good. But uh, we made it easy, got the job done, and everybody's happy. Now, the other question, Bellator's doing some great things right now. You know, since Scott Coker took over, it's, it's just a totally different product. Uh, yeah. Would and they got they got truckloads of money. You know, they're, they're, there's talk they're they're going to offer multi million dollars a fight to Brock Lesnar, and that that's that's pretty much nice. fact coming from yeah. high level people at Spike. It, it's it's going to happen. Now, if they come after after this one FC and and they want to talk to you, would that be something you'd you'd consider if it, if the money's right, or you've already climbed that mountain and it doesn't interest you? Yeah, I don't know. Obviously, the MMA world and life in general is crazy. So I don't, I don't think so. But I'll, I'll never say never with stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's a a good way to 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 leave it because uh, you know they they might have this monster offer, and you know it's it's not very often that the best guy in the weight division becomes a free agent because. Usually with the UFC, that you become like a restricted free agent, or or that uh, matching stuff that you had to go through with Bellator, and it, it just seems to be a messy game. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's the not fun part about me. Uh, not fun part about MMA for me. I mean, the best thing about wrestling to me is you show up to the nationals, you win the nationals, you go to the world, you go to the world, you win that, you're the champ, right? It's right. nice and easy and simple, and, and that's what I like about uh, about wrestling and MMA. There's all these contracts and everything else, and it gets just gets confusing and political and all those things that I don't really like. Right now, you mentioned earlier about how you take your role as a coach. You 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 coach uh, you know the, the best guys in the world like Pettis, and you, you coach 
little kids at, at your uh, wrestling academy that you have with your brother Max. Uh, yeah. Is, is coaching wrestling something you see in your future, maybe a uh, Division One head coach after, you, after you're done with fighting? Yeah, I always thought I was going to just stay in the college wrestling world. And like I said, you never say never. Life is uh, crazy. It's crazy. It leads you in funny places. And so now I, uh, I totally even you know left the the college wrestling world. I don't do anything with them right now. But uh, at this point, I don't know. I, I really, really enjoy coaching the kids. It's it's fun. You get to see them grow up. You get to see them mature. You get to be an important part of. Uh, of their sports life maturing and growing up to an adult. So I don't know what I'm going to do at this point, uh, whether I'm going to go back to college coaching or, you know, I might just stay and coach the pro practice at Rupert Sport and do my academies at night and do that. Uh, so that would, that would be really nice to me too. So I've got a lot of good options, and that's a good thing. Yeah, you mentioned that you have a lot of options. And, you know, like this, you were even considering retiring from MMA if – you know, b- before this one FC deal came across your yeah. table. Yeah, I you know I even went to in the Duke's office and had the meeting to talk about what happens if I retired. And, you know, by staying on as a coach, what am I going to do? I, I had that meeting with him because I I was really thinking about it, and um, yeah, I just uh, I made that decision that it wasn't my time to retire yet, and I know I got a lot of good fights left in me, but. Um, Retirement's never too far away from my mind because uh, I've been in this game a long time. That being wrestling and MMA, and uh, I mean, been training seriously year round for probably for the last sixteen years. So at some point here in the, in the future, I'll uh, hang up the old gloves and just start coaching. So with the UFC, you know, you you had that that meeting with Dana Lorenzo, and if they would have made just a any kind of decent offer that wasn't insulting, it, you probably would have accepted it. Yeah, at that point, um, at that point, I probably would have, honestly, because at that point, well, I mean, even right now, I'm doing decent financially for myself. I'm not going to tell you I'm a millionaire or anything, but I've been smart enough with the money I've made, and I've, I've made some good investments and in starting some businesses that it wasn't really about money at that point. At that point, it was about proving that I was the best in the world, and that's what it was about. Um, So, yeah, I think you're right on on that one. Yeah, because it it was one of those weird things where it was just like, uh, I I think Dana said that you're just not his type of guy. And uh, That was like, that was a little wild down the road. The first thing he said was, I just, I'm not good enough. Ha. Well, I, know, right? I, I I think that that was window dressing, so that all the 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 sheeple that follow him on Twitter and yeah. you know praise him <laughs> and just agree with everything he says, I think that was for them. You know, but I, I think the people that are you know pretty keen observers of this sport know that it was a, a personal vendetta to keep you out of the UFC, and Lorenzo went along with it. Usually, he's there to put him in line. But he just, yeah. for whatever reason, said, no, d- do whatever you want, Dana. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, I, I guess obviously I'm not in his head, so I don't have the final answer, but there's definitely a possibility. Yeah, it, it just it doesn't make much sense. It's just like, well, it, it, if you think the guy is an asshole and you, you can't work with him, I mean, what – what better angle, you know, to to sell the, to sell the fans – is this brash, you know, Olympic wrestler, undefeated, reigning world champion? I mean, it writes itself. You know, you, he's telling off the boss. I mean, it reminds me of Stone Cold Steve Austin and, and Vince McMahon. You know, when I'm I'm only a couple of years older than you, so when we were in high school, uh-huh. you know. Oh, I, I remember 100. percent That was. Uh... That was about when I stopped watching WWE, but that was, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly, you're hitting the nail on the head. I don't need to say anymore. <laughs> hey, I, I know I know you uh, got to get back to your football game, and uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, you taking the time. Uh, just leave us with your senior year and – one of uh, one of my buddies and your former teammate Tyler, he he told me about this. He, uh, okay. 
the all-star classic that you were going to go down in weight to, to Johnny Hendricks. I think he was at 165 pounds. You were at 174 and you were supposed to do this dream match at the all-star classic, which for the non-wrestling fans is this big like uh, kickoff for the season where the, the, the top guys and all your, your dream matches happen at this, at the uh, National Wrestling Coaches Association All-Star Classic. So what happened? Because you versus Hendricks didn't happen. Yeah, so, I, you know, number one, I love challenges, obviously. Number two, I sure as shit don't like Johnny Hendricks. So I said, hey, I'm going to drop some weight. I'm going to wrestle Johnny the All-Star Classic. And I did it. I, I lost weight. I, I fat tested for the right weight. That's something I do in wrestling. And I called up. The all-star committee and said, listen, I don't want to wrestle at 174. I already beat all them dudes. I want to wrestle Johnny Henderson 165. And they said, okay, let me let's think about it or whatever. And then they came back and said, oh, we can't do it. It's too late or something lame. And I said, well, fine, I'm not wrestling. I, you guys aren't going to give me what I want. That's just, I'm not wrestling the same guy I always wrestle. And uh, long story short, down the road, someone came to tell me that they actually asked Johnny to do the math and they tried to make it happen, but he didn't want to do it. So, I've known since that day, which was about seven eight years ago, that Johnny Hendricks is scared to face me in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I, I believe it. I mean, I don't, I don't, just why, why, why not, why not wrestle you, man? You know, it's the fans wanted to see it. He was, uh, you know, he he kind of had the reputation as as the guy that people didn't like. Now he's kind of seen as this this harmless country boy, but in college. Yep. The college was much much different. He was kind of a kind of a, a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he was. He just, and you know what? It's kind of hard to describe. You just got to be around him long enough, and you get it. <laughs> so th- this, I'm not this, serious about that. Just be around him long enough, and you'll get it. So th- this is not Ben Asker and trying to run an angle on people. You you just really don't like this guy. Straight up, I do not like Johnny Hendricks. So it makes it easy to play that part. Because I don't got to act at all. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's the best the uh, best type of angle when it's when it's when it's a shoot. So everything works out. You you, you win. You you beat up all those guys in one FC, and 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 uh, UFC offers you a a decent contract. That first fight, do you want to fight for whoever's got that belt, or do you want to settle this thing with Johnny Hendricks, or do you want friends? You know what? My wife asked me that question the other day, and I thought it was a good one. And I said, when Johnny was a champ, I get to go beat his ass and get the belt, so it can't really kill two birds with one stone, right? Okay. Um, and now, obviously, I can't kill both those birds with one stone. So, you know what? I don't want Johnny Hendricks so much. I said, I- I'll fight him if he doesn't have the belt. So, uh, you know, I guess I have to beat him up, but then go with whoever has the belt at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then the GSP one, man, that would probably be uh... – Maybe your your biggest fight ever because uh, you know he's got so many fans and he's been the UFC's biggest draw. You know, even even bigger than Brock Lesnar, uh, shockingly. You know, because the the Canadian fans just adore him so much, and you know, uh, w- with good reason. He's been a great champion. And yeah, I picked a fight with Rory this weekend too. So you know, trying to get that Canadian angle maybe somewhere down the road if GSP doesn't come back. What's what's this is the last thing I'll, I'll let you get back to your football game. But what's what's his uh, what do you think his deal is? Is is he really a weirdo or or is this all an elaborate work or is it all? Fair? I go I go with weirdo. <laughs> I would for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can only imagine you talking about him and. Uh, you know the, all the pre-fight shenanigans, but uh, you know, keep, I'll uh, I'll be following you. Uh, you know your your next fight uh, in, in Jakarta or, or wherever it's at, and uh, yeah, uh, continued su- success, man. Because you're making it look real easy over there. You, I, don't, I don't think you've you've broken a sweat in that one FC cage. Well, I'm not. You know, I'm gonna tell you. I'm getting pretty good at this MMA thing, and I don't know if I'm going to break a sweat in any cage. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's leave it with that. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for uh, taking the time, man. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Be good. Bye. 
All right, welcome to the FRB show. I got a special guest for you, uh, known as American Fedor or the insane one, someone who's hasn't fought in a few years but is uh, making a lot of noise right now. Justin McCauley, all the way from Hawaii. What's up, brother? I said that's why on the FRB show, even though it's my first time. You know, so um, really excited to be here. Really excited to talk about the subject. Obviously, it's been big news for uh, you know a few months now since Stephen Bonner and myself went in and took over live TV and pulled uh, the biggest stunt known to date in, in mixed martial arts history. So uh, it's been nothing but a, a, a greatness ever since. You know, we put somebody on blast that needed to be put on blast, and I think we got him on the ropes, and he's running running scared and uh, trying to duck and, and hide for cover, but uh, we ain't going to let that happen. So take me back in September. You and Bonner on national TV, you confront Tito. How do you... I assume you're friends with Bonner. Uh, I think I think you might share a manager or or did in the past, Wayne. Uh, I'm not sure on that 100. percent But take us through how how this became reality. You know, it was kind of a, it was kind of a weird thing. Uh, I hadn't heard from Tito for a while. We had to, you know we had some business that was unfinished, and uh, he, he just didn't re- really want to recognize. And then you know we we had some negotiations on the Force Three fight, and and uh, he. He basically, you know, he told me off did at the end, you know, and I was like, really, bro, after all we've been through, you know, and basically it was just like negotiating on, on what, what it was going to take to get me up to Big Bear to, to live up there for, you know, six weeks and eight weeks, whatever it was, and leave my family and, uh, and, and my career and everything that I have going on to support him one more time and help him, you know, in a quest for, you know, extending his career and, and, and lifting himself, you know, um, and so unfortunately you know that reaction right there question made me question our friendship you know and not hearing from him after you know a while a while has gone by and and you know my phone wasn't ringing i didn't get any christmas cards i was like all right you know maybe it's maybe it's just pricking out on me you know and you know big league and like he normally does and so i just took it for face value and i got an opportunity to work with Stefan and I had a really good chance at, at beating Tito and, and you know Stefan's a tough guy he's never going to make excuses for himself but uh, you know he had a broken toe in camp he had a, a partially torn shoulder a week before the fight they put him on a heart monitor they almost they, they didn't clear Stefan before the fight until Tuesday the week of the fight and so you know there's plenty of things that didn't allow Bonner to show up 100% that night. He still had a split decision. So it was, you know, a pretty close fight. I think Tito plays some takedowns at some good good points and good times, but taking us back to, to our stunt and our event, it was just one of those things where we looked at an opportunity. We're going to be in this situation anyways. How do we make it as big as we can? How do we put Tito on his heels, play some psychological head games, and, and make him understand that, it's something bigger than just a you and Stefan fighting. There's a lot that's going behind, you know, behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And Stefan was willing to put him, put him on blast and pull his card. And it was, it was beautiful. I mean, we uh, walked into live television and took over and it was, it was an electric experience. I mean, doing, doing something that's scripted or and that you're being told to do, you know, is one thing when it pops off without a hitch and then you get, you know, a, a big reaction out of it. That's really cool. But to go in there to roll the dice and to gamble, to put together a little game plan and to have us execute flawlessly on live TV, it was incredible. And it's an experience, you know, obviously Stefan and myself will carry it. And Tito will carry it with him forever, too. You know, we'll carry it with us forever. And uh, and it'll always be a, a historical moment and a, and a game changer for you know, the sport of MMA. Yeah, you know, I uh, I, I was up in uh, Connecticut at the UFC event. Uh, Overeem was fighting Ben Ro- Ben Rothwell. So I didn't get an opportunity to see it live, but I, I checked my phone and Twitter was just going nuts about this big confrontation. And I, I finally got to see it. And I was just like, well, this is great. I mean, here's, here's Bonner confronting Tito, who doesn't look like he's in on the, it doesn't look like an angle that he's been smartened up about. But, <laughs> so funny you know right it was classic because here's Tito pacing back and forth and he's doing his Huntington Beach bad boy stick you know he's grinding his jaw he's trying to look as tough as he can and uh I'm sitting under this mask and I'm I'm laughing so hard inside I'm like dying I'm like you don't even know what's about to happen to you dude and you think you're up here and it's all about you again but guess what buddy you're about to get the carpet pulled out from under your feet and that's exactly what happened 
And his reaction, he says, "Oh, I just laughed. It was no big deal." But yeah, right. He just laughed. It, it looked like it looked like somebody hissed in his Cheerios and then threw them on him. You know what I mean? It was it was hilarious. Dude. I couldn't. We couldn't have planned it any better, and it couldn't have got, gone off any better. And what we heard was, you know, a lot of people at the UFC started leaving and coming over over to Bellator and then, you know, all, all the news and, 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 you know, all the reporters and everybody was talking about it so much that, you know, the, the journalists that were there wanted to come over and see what was going on. And, and late to late, late in the, the wee hours of the night, we had people coming up to us, you know, at, at Foxwoods and, and, uh, and, and greeting us and, and, you know, or at the Mohegan Sun there and, and greeting us and, and trying to, you know, talk to us and see what, what went on and, and get the, uh, get the overview of the whole event. And, we were glad to sit there and explain what had happened and tell everybody about it. And it became quickly the biggest buzz in the industry. So uh, it was, it was just phenomenal to put that together, to have the foresight to do something like that. And then to have it, you know, come off without a hitch. Well, here's a big question. Why two masks? That was my first, when I saw it, I was like, why two? Well, the first one you could see through, you know, so he could like, the first one he would have been able to see me. He would have been like, and that was the thing. I was sitting in the, in the crowd. I walk into the, I walk into the building and people are looking at me and they're going, who is this guy? You know, I mean, we walk into the casino like that from the airport, got in the limo and I'm like, all right, it's fine. Somebody was in the lobby. We didn't want him to understand that I was there yet and uh, didn't want him to know. And so we, we held it as tight as we could, you know, all the way up into the, the hotel room, all the way back down backstage, all the way out to the arena and then sitting in the arena for a good hour, sweating bullets under that, under the two masks in a full suit just holding my ground going, no way I'm giving this one up. You know, we're going to, we're going to do this. And, uh, and so eventually, you know, I'm talking to the boys, all right, Stefan, you're up, it's your time. And, uh, even, you know, Zach Light and, and Rich Cho and, and, uh, he's sure Sherwood and all these guys are all hanging out and they're looking at us going, what the F is going on with these guys? I mean, I can't believe, you know, what we're seeing, like Stefan, what is this? You know? And he's like, just wait, just wait, you're going to see, you know? And, and so eventually, uh, uh, it, it, we got up there and you pull the one mask, one mask off and guess what? You don't know who it is yet. So now you pull the second mask off and there's a bigger reveal. So it was like, Stefan got to reveal me. Then I got to reveal me too. And, uh, I didn't think about the two masks until I was out shopping for him the week of and thinking like, okay, how can we really, really mess with him? Okay. What if he pulls one off and then there's still one there and then he's going to be like, what the heck's going on? You know? So it's kind of a, kind of a, uh, just one of those timing things that worked out perfect. And so the two masks was just to make sure nobody saw who I was and nobody compromised uh, my identity. Sure. And so you 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 were working the gimmick. You sold it. Now you do you have a professional wrestling background? <laughs> I, I yeah, I sure do. I uh, wrestled with New Japan for wrestling, Antonio Noki's group uh, for years. Me and uh, Joni Lauer were tag team partners over there, and uh, I was a six time tag team champion for the UPW Ultimate for Ultimate Pro Wrestling. Uh, we're kind of like a feeder league to the WWE. We had John Cena and Samoa Joe and RVD and all kinds of guys come through our league and wrestle. And um, me and myself and uh, my tag team partner, the hardcore kid, who became Jesus eventually in WWE, we're going to go that route. So I wanted to go to Japan and fight for Pancreas and, you know, kind of following like Ken Shamrock's footsteps and all those guys who, you know, Boss Rudin and Maurice Smith and, you know, everybody who had gone over there, Guy Metzger and, and all the early guys, Frank Shamrock, and then on to rings. And, and these are these are, are leagues that were designed around professional wrestling rules that were actually real fights. So there are a bunch of body slaps to the face, all throws and submissions are legal, and you get a couple rope escapes to keep it interesting. And so I decided to go that route. Um, I had a small bout with ECW before it was sold to WWE and then uh, decided to go – Japan wrestling. Fortunately, it was uh, hired by Anoki uh, to run the New Japan Dojo in Santa Monica, California for him for a few years. It was uh, one of his bodyguards in Tokyo. And, uh, and yeah, so professional wrestling has always been a part of my life. I think it's beautiful. And I think there's a great parallel between professional wrestling and mixed martial arts that needs to be embraced a little bit more. Yeah, well, there's a certain segment of the MMA uh, group of fans who, who think the wrestling, you know, it's all, you know, well, I guess it is scripted, but uh, they think that it's like uh, insulting their intelligence to to run angles and stuff. And I often bring up to them, well, you know, we're talking about Tito. How about Tito versus Shamrock, that whole feud? That was straight out of professional wrestling. How about the Gracies versus uh, versus Sakuraba? 
program. That's straight out of pro wrestling. Sap straight out of pro wrestling. These are all the some of yeah. the biggest money you bring, angles. You bring up amazing points. I mean, half of Pride was all pro wrestling, you know, and, and so the angles that were there, the guys that were fighting there, and that was what was drawing the Japanese crowds there. I mean, before Pride came along, uh, K1 was, you know, the second toughest league out there next to New Japan Pro Wrestling, which was Inoki's league, which had all the top dog shooters in, in the country, you know, uh, the soccer office, the Takara, uh, the Masakata Tanaki, the Suzuki's, you know, all these guys that were amazing. Um, and so you, you look at it like that and you, you think, well, a lot of the athletes that we love to watch in Pride and that gave Pride its value by putting their names on the line we're professional wrestlers. So um, you can, you know, you can be a layman and not really know what's going on behind the scenes and not have done your homework and understand what the transition was from professional wrestling back to shooting. But if you go back far enough, professional wrestling was shooting. Professional wrestling was mixed martial arts. It just got to be uh, to the point there where it was you know, going into stalemate matches. Matches were lasting for an hour, two hours in, in the big top, and they had to figure out a way to work it, make it interesting for the crowd. So out comes, you know, these high spots and professional routing, these different characters and things that were larger than life that would make people want to come and believe in these people more than they would believe in themselves. So it's all smoke and mirrors at the end of the day when, you, when, you, when you're talking about promotions and fights and things like that. Um, now, getting into the ring and performing, that's a different deal. So if you can do both, now you're something special, you know? And so I truly feel that, that us that, that understand that, how to promote and sell a fight and use our, our, uh, our minds to, to create these cool angles and put mystery, you know, on something like, who's the masked man? What's going on here? And it gr- draws people in. And if we just sat here and we watched fighting on mute, uh, People would, you know, they'd watch for a long time and the hardcore fans would always be there, but we wouldn't draw any extra fans, you know, and what we're doing now is we're bringing in extra fans. If you look at the ratings between, you know, professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, professional wrestling is still superior in the ratings department. And and part of that is because they have superior storylines. And so Bellator opening up the door to that um, and letting us do that that night, not to say that they should start doing that a lot or anything, but I think just that, you know, that one marquee moment where we, uh, where we dipped into the grab bag, so to speak, uh, was beautiful. And I think it worked very successfully. Bringing 2 million eyeballs to the table was something that, you know, up until that point was unheard of. Yeah, I I was going to say, though, you know, you you make a a good point about these storylines or angles. And I think we've gotten to a point here where the heat is enough to where Rich Chow needs to make Tito versus Justin McCulley on spike or, or on pay-per-view, whatever the, wherever the platform will be. And is that, is that a fight that you think is, is realistic? You haven't fought in three years. That's, that's a billion percent, you know, a billion percent. Me and Tito know each other better than anybody. We put more hours in the gym against each other, uh, than anybody. We've been training partners longer, you know, than, than most people, you know, have careers. So I, uh, I know him well, he knows me well, we know the ins and outs and, and, our styles complement each other. When we got into our sparring matches, people should have sold tickets. I mean, we were having some barn burners in the gym that, you know, never people never got to see. So it, it'd be an amazing fight for the fans. It'd be an amazing fight uh, in Orange County. I think we, we could sell out a big arena in Orange County and, uh, and make great business, you know? And that going into this, it wasn't like we're saying, hey, let's make a pro wrestling angle and try to make this pro wrestling. We didn't even think about it we never even pro wrestling the word pro wrestling never never entered our our mind in in the gimmick we just said hey let's go out there and mess with his head let's go do something funny if you pull a mask off me and he understands that i'm in your corner now not in his corner any longer the guy that he depended on to help him get victories then he's gonna he's gonna be shaken up a little bit and granted he was so um and now he's got to be pissed he's got to look at me and say you know you mother effort i can't believe you did that to me and sold me out like that but hey buddy you sold me out first and i got business with you and it's not gonna stop until we get that case troll account today hit up my twitter talk all the smack you want try to maliciously slander me create libel you know d- disregard me and my contributions to the sport of mixed martial arts and all day long tito but that's not going to stop me that's not going to take away what me and you have between each other when it comes to the the paycheck that was never paid, you and me got business, bro. So the only way to handle it is man to man. Let's get into that cage. Let's throw the hand, little chingasos, and, and at the end of it, we'll see what's up. We'll see who the better man is. The problem is he knows to get his ass kicked, and that's why he's ducking like a little Sally. He's running out of the back door going, no, I don't, uh, uh, I'm too big for that. 
oh no, uh, yeah, because you're scared. He's scared. He knows it's coming. He knows he's got an ass whooping on the menu, and he better order it up real soon, or it's going to get worse and worse. This is one that he he's he's one of the best. You know, in the world, he's a legend. I, I give him that. I'll always give him that. I helped him gain that status, and I helped him keep that status, and, and I truly believe in his ability, and I think he's an amazing fighter and, and all that kind of stuff. But what he did was, was was bullshit, you know? So at the end of the day, it's like, hey, bro, be a man, and let's do it. That's how men settle their business. If you, you want to be a little south and run around and, and avoid the, the situation... I, I think people are going to lose a lot of respect for him. I think his fans will lose a lot of respect for him. I mean, he, he let a guy deface and devalue him and jump in the ring and, and punk him on national TV, and he's not going to step up and take the challenge. And then he does things like throw water on Stefan after he beat him. He got 20, fine 2,500. Hey, I'm climbing over the cage telling him, you know, F that, buddy. Come on, me and you. And, and you know, the commission's going, get off the cage, Justin, or you're going to get fined. I'm like, okay, no problem, you know. So that last thing I want to do is mess with the commissioner, lose the license, or get a fine or anything like that. But this guy's got no regard for his opponents. He's got no regard for his training partners. He loves the nut hangers, the cherry swingers that hang around him just so they could be part of the Tito show. It's all fake. It's all, 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 all. No. It's all going to dissolve right before his eyes. And uh, I'm going to be the man that puts him on his back and ground and pounds him in front of everybody. Now, the last time that you were part of what you call the Tito show, was that UFC 84 against Machida? Yes, it was, um, and you know it, it was that it was that show right there where uh, where it all flipped on him. You know, he had, he had not taken care of me, not done his deal. He started to you know spend all his money on on porn stars and and big parties, and uh, and that's something I I didn't want to be a part of. And so yeah, I walked away. So that that led to his uh, departure from the UFC, or or you know his. Uh he didn't go anywhere, but he, he sat out for maybe like 18 months. And then he, he came back, I think against, uh, against Forrest, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. Okay. That was actually a great fight. You know, that was a great, him and Machida, I thought was a beautiful matchup. Um, you know, Machida, obviously he ran a little bit there, but he, he played a, he played a smart game versus Tito and obviously won the decision and, and went on to win the belt and do some amazing things there. Tito would have won that fight if he would have listened and he would have done the right thing. Um, it's just, you know, he's his own worst enemy at the end of the day. And you saw it in his, you know, in what, a 10, 11 fight span, he had like three victories. And that's why, because he, he, you know, he hurt the people that were helping him the most. Now, when things really went sour is the Matt Hamill fight. Am I understanding that right? UFC 121. That's all, that's all BS. That's how he says it, but that's not the real deal. At the Matt Hamill fight, I was, I was really knee deep busy in my own thing. on my daughters and and, uh, my own life. You know, and he's come up here, you know, okay, I can, but, you know, are you going to break me off? Yeah, dude, I always do. Well, no, you always don't, or I wouldn't be asking you that question. You know what I mean? Like, I, the question would have never came out of my mind if I was completely happy with how you're compensating me. I would have been like, hell yeah, I'm coming up there, let's go. So, you know, obviously he contradicts himself there, and where the real problem lied was with the Forest 3 fight. He, you know, he asked me what it would take to get me up there. I said, this is it. And he said, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, I was like, this is just negotiations. You don't got to get weird, you know. And uh, basically, you know, what I was asking him for was very, very modest in comparison to what he was making. I mean, we're talking peanuts. And so for him to have that kind of reaction, that's not a reaction a friend has to another friend. You know, you know that was very vulgar and crass. And to come, come at me like that was 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 really really hurtful you know so at the end of the day and he put me in a really bad position financially you know i spent months and months if not years helping this guy gain what he needed in his career when i have fights he disappear oh jenna says i can only come for like two weeks dude uh two weeks dude i just spent eight weeks with you getting you ready and you're gonna give me two weeks bro and and he would show up to corner you know he'd only show up to corner to get on tv you know so he could put punishment on tv it wasn't like he was showing up to help his fighters win or anything like that. He was showing up for the advertisement and the marketing for his own game and his company. So he really didn't put the care back into the guys that were helping him as the guys did when they were helping him. So it's all just conflicting and contradicting and everything he says is wrong, you know, and, and even trying to blame it on the Matt Hamill situation. No, dude, it wasn't that. It was the Forest three fight that it finally fell apart. So everything he said is lies. You know, it's just crazy. So you mentioned Jenna when when she came into the picture. Maybe I think it might have been middle of two thousand and six when he was still embroiled with that Shamrock feud. Was that the beginning of a of a downward spiral for him? One hundred percent. You know, I mean, I don't want to say anything you know too bad about anybody, but when 
certain people get together, it's just not good. You know, you just like, you can see the writing on the wall and their relationship's going to go south. And, and, and that one was just tumultuous and turbulent. And I mean, they had some, they had some really probably awesome chemistry, you know, behind the doors, but some really, really ugly chemistry also. And it was very apparent and it was just getting worse it was like a like a growing cancer that relationship and obviously uh both of their careers were were hurt because of it um i'd say more his than hers but you know it's just the it's just the way it is it seemed like she came in at a time where he was on top and uh when they broke out he was he was not on top any longer and all of us were there we we had put together an amazing team um team punishment was reigning supreme again you know he went out and fought for the belt again and all of us were doing great our careers were doing great and he decided to sell it all out and you know let let uh let her do what she does and and you know manipulate the scene and and uh next thing you know he uh he bought it hook line and sinker and sold us all out you know and that's his that's his uh that's his onus you know he's got to take that and and run with that ball and live with that forever but unfortunately so do we I I never understood why these guys who have some level of fame would want to get real serious with a porn star that has, you know, just a a really bad background. I mean, I'm not going to say that every, you know, she didn't, she didn't have a great upbringing to, to put it lightly. Right. I mean, why, why do you, why why do you, why would somebody make that decision? Did it all for the nookie. You know I mean? That's pretty much what it comes down to at the end of the day. You know, it feels good in the pocket. And you're like, wow, this is great. I love it. You know what I mean? And, and uh, I would imagine, you know, that had something to do with it. But um, it, it was just, and sometimes, you know, Tito didn't have a great upbringing himself. And I think they both understood each other a lot in that respect and, and, and kind of uh, hid hidden one another for a while there. But, you know, I think it became apparent to him after a while that, hey, I am hiding here and, and I'm not living any longer and I need to go out and be me and live again. And I think that's what he did. And hats off to him for that. It's just too late for the rest of us, you know. So we bore, we, we bared the burden as much as he did, I think, at the end. Well, not as much as he did, but, you know, some of it anyhow. And so, you know, I, I feel bad for him for making those decisions. I really do, even now, as pissed off as I am at him and, and me even wanting to get him in the cage and put a put a schooling on him. Even at that, I still feel like, you know, hey, man, you, you, you did a bad thing to yourself there, you know, and sorry for you, but you did it to yourself. So let's, let's just say you guys get in the cage, do some good business, you know, you get paid, Tito gets paid. Do you think that this could be put in the past? Because I, I've seen him, you know, call you uh, – you were his best friend at one time. Do you think, is it, is it so beyond that? It, it could never be again or. Well, you know, that's on him. You know, I didn't do anything wrong to him. I didn't go out of my way to, to fuck him over. I didn't go out of my way to, to, you know, to, to put him in a bad position or use him or use his time. Never did any of that to him. So it's on him. You know, he, he's had plenty of time to make it right. And and now we're just, we're just in a position where we're running out of time, you know, and it's like, I'm not going to sit here and have that uh, in my life where uh, one of my best friends screwed me over and isn't even making an effort to make it right. I mean, that, that's when people, you know, throw down. So it's time to throw down. So what's up? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting fight. I mean, it, you know, you haven't uh, fought or in MMA in three years. Uh, you're typically a, a heavyweight. Would you come down to two hundred five, or would there be some kind of catch weight? Or I'm already dropping. I'm already uh, I'm already in the gym. I've uh, I've been doing my diligence. You know, changed up my diet and uh, been been working my ass off to get to get down to where I need to be and uh, get in that shape and. You know, I mean, 20, 2012, I think it was my last, last fight a couple of years back, and, and it was a good fight. With Justin Grisard, he's a tough dude, and, and uh, I put him away pretty pretty quickly, and as I should have. And, and so, you know, I feel like um, I'm, I'm as strong as I'll ever be. I'm as good as I'll ever be, and uh, there's no time like the present to do it. You know, unfortunately, life happens sometimes, so for O'Brien. And what happened to me was I came home one day, and I found uh, – my mom dying on the floor and and uh so i like you know i kind of held her in my arms while she passed and so there's a couple years there where i had to go on and, and like deal with some family stuff and and get over it and get over that before i could get back in the cage i just wasn't i wasn't whole you know and uh so now after a couple years of healing and, and getting you know my mind set back i'm ready to get back after it and uh unfortunately that guy you know 
man. Uh, and there's some other business there, some other things that happened after after Mom passed, you know, where where he reached out and asked for my help, and I helped him out, and then uh, I needed him to return the favor, and and he he screwed me over again, and so it was like, bro, that's it, done. You know, now I want to fight you, dude. Now I want, now I want to, now now I want to put hands on you for that. And uh, unfortunately, you know, again, he did it to himself. I would have never felt this way about a friend unless they gave me reason to. So he proved that he wasn't a friend. He proved that he didn't want to be friends. He proved that, uh, unfortunately, the only way to fix this one is to scrap. Now, have you had conversations with Scott Coker and Rich Chow about signing a contract with Bellator? You know, that would be the first step in making this a reality. You know, I, I, I'm reluctant to speak about that now. Um, we have some things in the works and, and, uh, and, you know, I just don't, I don't want to say anything yet. I don't want to speak prematurely. Um, I, and, and again, I don't want to lead on to anything. Uh, but you know, hopefully the stars will align and things will work themselves out. Um, it'd be great for Bellator. It'd be great for the sport. It'll be great for, you know, for everybody involved, not to mention that there'll be an amazing fight for everybody to witness. So, um, all the way around, it makes sense. You know, it makes sense angle-wise. Obviously, I was coaching Stefan. Stefan fell short. Um, and, you know, I called Tito out and put him on blast and, you know, wore the mask and, you know, did all that kind of stuff. So in, in his fans' eyes, I sold out. And, okay, I sold him out. I'm kicking my ass then. You know what I mean? So here it is. It's on the table. I'm ready. I'll be waiting in the cage for you if you want. So anyway, it's got to happen. Let's do it. Yeah, it is a perfect angle because uh, for whatever reason, Tito's become a huge baby face at this point. And, you know, they're chanting his name like it was 2002 again in San Diego. And I think if you, if you put that in Anaheim, you know, you would, ha- you would be the heel. You'd, you'd be, uh, you know, getting the beer thrown on you. And, uh, you know, he would be the, the hometown hero again. So Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. They can think what they want, you know. I, I hope they do love Tito. I hope they, they do want to buy his T-shirts and and follow him around and all that kind of stuff because that makes him look stupid. You know, it's like, I mean, uh, the mixed martial arts fans are the greatest fans in the world. They follow who they like, and once they like you, they love you, and they'll die for you. And I think that's beautiful in our sport. But right now, I'm calling out every Team Punishment fan that doesn't know the true story, an idiot. Tito, you're an idiot, and all your T-shirt-wearing thugs are idiots, too. I'll slap you around, and they can all watch. Wow. So who's representing you? I, I I don't know if if I got this right, but were you represented by Wayne Harriman, who also has a a very close allegiance to Tito and credited with getting him back in the UFC? Well, that's correct. We know we know that Wayne Harriman definitely got uh, Tito back in the UFC, and you know did an amazing thing for him and got him a, a great contract and all that kind of stuff. And you know he's one of the he's one of the greatest managers in the sport, if you ask me. And so you know. Um, Absolutely. You know, we talk on a regular basis and uh, he's a great dude. And, and so, uh, you know, it is what it is. But uh, again, I just don't, I don't want to say too much or talk too much now. I just, you know, I'm, hopefully things will work themselves out and uh, we'll get to conduct this business. just like we sh- should be. Yeah. For, for those of you who aren't up with, uh, you know, some of the inner workings, Wayne Harriman uh, co-manages, John Jones, Carlos Condit, Benson Henderson with Malki Kawa, uh, first round management. But the, the history with, uh, with Wayne Harriman and Tito Ortiz goes back to the 90s. And uh, Justin probably knows it better than me, but I heard that it was Wayne Harriman who told Tito Ortiz to hire this 20 something year old guy who wanted to get in the game, but nobody would give him an opportunity back then. And his name was Dana White. Nice. Is that, nice. does that sound about right? Or, you know, that was actually, uh, that's a little bit even before my time, but it sounds about correct for the way I heard things. And, um, you know, there's, there's people, um, you know, in the business that many people don't know about that do major, major things, you know, and, and Wayne happens to be one of them. And so, um, Dana obviously is an amazing man and did a great thing for the sport and did an an even better thing for Tito's career. I mean, it's easy to be the UFC poster boy when you have Dana White as your manager and you have Gordon Beers as your sponsors and we know who owns that. So we, we saw Tito become the poster child very quickly and it was because of those allegiances and because of the people that were behind him. And unfortunately you've seen those people turn their back on him because of how they treat, how he treated them. So there's a, 
there's definitely some heat there and I would I would bet my life on it. It's not the fault of all the rest of us who are pointing the finger at him. Wow. Yeah, I mean that's this is uh you know a lot of drama, a lot of uh you know a lot of uh, moving parts here. It's an interesting story and that's that's why I'm so interested in it and uh, I mean to be honest with you I you know, I, I didn't know that uh, you were thinking about coming back. I, I didn't I didn't know anything. I really hadn't heard much about you in a couple of years. And then I heard, you know, you were in a ring with a, uh, you know, with a mask on. And I'm just like, what? And, and then I saw it and I was just yeah, like, now, yeah. now it's all making sense. And, you know, it's uh, it's a great angle. It was it was smart of you guys. I know Bonner is a smart guy. Um I have a I have a, another buddy who's who's close to him and and uh, you know pretty famous in the industry and compares notes with him quite a bit because he's he's a creative guy. But um, do you have any like a, a time frame of when you want this fight to happen? Or well, I mean, I'm sure he's got some healing up to do. I know. I mean, it it, it was you, you think that he's. Stefan took the the brunt of the damage in that last fight, but I'm sure Tito took some too. You know. He's probably got some healing up to do. So, hey, whenever you want, dude, I'm there. I mean, you could set it for tomorrow. You could set it for two months from now, six months from now, a year. I don't care. I Just just as long as I get my shot at, at putting my hands on that guy, that's all I care about. Yeah. Well, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, they have, they have all the footage of you, you know, in the cage with the mask, Tito going crazy. You know, they have all these audio sound bites of, of you just completely burying the guy. And Tito's, like I said, has become a big baby face now at the at the end of his career because, you know, let's be serious. There's a lot of great things that Tito did that he really doesn't get credit for as far as getting this sport to where it is today. It, you know, usually it just goes to the Fertitas and Dana. But, you know, like you said, they needed a poster boy in 2002 and... Yeah, and you know, you look at a lot of the the top fights, uh, the top programs in in the history of UFC, and Tito's in a lot of them. You know, he might not. Have you won. know, I always said that. I always said, and, and you know, when Tito and I were riding together, I kind of felt like we're we're you know the um, we're the Jedi Knights versus versus the dark side in a way. Sometimes, you know, and and uh, I didn't think that he was getting his due. And for more money for himself, I always backed him up on that because I truly believe he deserved it. But you look at what they put into to making him that poster child and they deserve it just as equally. You know, did they, did they uh, use him and his abilities and his, and his stuff? Well, sure. But did they also make him something that was future than life? Yes, they did. And is he still riding that wave? Yes, he is. So they deserve as much credit as he does. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he got in the cage, he did it. He, he was the poster child and rightfully so you got to give credit where credit's due. Tito Ortiz is a major reason why mixed martial arts is as cool and as popular as it is today. And I'll never say anything different. I'll always give him that credit for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, I, I agree with you there. Uh, and I, I yeah, I, I like that, that you're, you're giving him, him his due there, but Hey, you're, you've been a piece of shit to me otherwise. And you know, I, let's just settle it. Let's just both make some money and draw a lot of viewers and, uh, you know, after we uh, handle our business in the cage, then you know, whatever happens, happens. That's it, you know. I mean, and, and his guys will be coming out, oh, why don't you handle it in-house? So, yeah, well, I tried to handle it in-house. I was still trying to handle it in-house. And until I got to the position where I had an opportunity to put it in your face on national TV, well, guess what, homie, it happened. So now what? Now everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows what you did, and now it's time to pay the piper. you got to jump in the cage and scrap. That's it. You run, you lost. If you don't take it, you lost. So if you, I mean, if you want to look like a little a little bitch, then he can. You know what I mean. But when you when you do something to somebody and they call you out, it's time to scrap. Period. Right. So you know, like I said, I'll always give him his due. I'll always consider him a legend and as great as he was. Shit, I rode, I was riding along with him. Dude, we we're doing it together. I was sitting on the on the on the cage on the apron, coaching him, yelling what he should be hearing in the middle of the in the middle of the. Uh, in the middle of the round so he could do the right thing. You know, I mean, that Vitor Belfort fight, in my mind, was the pivotal fight in his career, and in the comeback anyway, after he'd been dismissed from the UFC, so to speak. So, um, And me being a Carlson Gracie, uh, Alan Goes Blackwell, and, and training, have, had trained with Vitor Belfort many, many times in the past at that point, gave us a lot of insight on that fight. And, and I truly believe that I was the most valuable guy in the camp on that fight. And that fight, you know, I think put him on 
put him back on the pedestal he needed to be on. So, you know, he, he's, he owes, he owes some shit and he, he knows that. And when, when it's, uh, when he's not giving it, I'm going to get it. I'm going to come take it. So it's time for me to come take it. Yeah. Yeah. And if he, and if, if he don't think you're a credible opponent, you know, he, he can just show up and beat you up and, uh, you know, and get an easy payday then, you know, if, if he doesn't exactly. think that, that it's good business. Like, like you said, I'm, I'm coming off a long layoff. I've never been down to that weight. Shit, it should be an easy fight for him, right? So wh- wh- what are you scared of, homie? If, you're, if, there's, if there's no reason to be scared, why are you running? Where are you going? Let's do this. Yeah. And I mean, who, who, else, out there, who else out there makes sense? You know, I don't think anybody else on the, on the Bellator roster, on the UFC roster, in this whole entire world on this planet right now, there is no other angle that makes sense besides me and Tito jumping in that cage. Yeah, the only other thing that I could come up with is Mo Lawal, and Tito has no interest in fighting Mo Lawal because I think he, he knows he, he would just get taken down by the, by Mo. But uh, there, to me, there's only two options. There's a Bonner rematch, which the public is, is not hot on, and then there's you versus Tito, which you know the, the gears are already in motion. So like all this, they've done all this groundwork. And then, you know, you're pro wrestling guy. Why do all the groundwork and then don't get the payoff at the end? Period. You know, you, you're looking at it. Everybody knows 2 million people tuned in because of the stunt that me and Stephen Bonner pulled. Tito wasn't getting the four. People say, oh, it's Tito. Everybody just tuned in to watch Tito. Really? How many people tuned in to watch him and Schlemenko? Not that many. I guarantee it. And so you're talking about apples and oranges. You're talking about two different worlds. When, when, when Macaulay comes to town, you know, people are going to tune in. When we, me, me and Tito get in that cage, there's going to, I guarantee there's going to be more than 2 million people watching it. And that's something special. And that's something that's, a, that's an industry building fight. And, uh, I think it's something that that's fresh and great for, for everything that's moving forward in the, in the business today. So I'm, I'm sticking with it. You know, there's no reason for him not to take this fight. And, uh, the only reason why he wouldn't take this fight, if he, if he's scared, if he's shaking, you know, but if he's scared and shaking, you know, I'll iron his skirt for him and he can wear it out tonight. <laughs> well, Justin, thanks. Thanks for taking some time out of your day. Uh, this has, you know, I, I love professional wrestling and professional wrestling being in- integrated into a shoot environment. So this is one, that's why I reached out to you. And I was like, I got to talk to this guy because this is a really interesting angle. And if any, if in any way, any small minor way, I can kind of push this agenda forward and say, Hey guys, this is the fight because we know the fight promoters at the end of the day, they listen to their customer. And if the fans keep, keep demanding this and say, Hey, who is this guy that keeps calling them out? Let's do this fight. I I guarantee you rich and Scott uh, will, will do it. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for coming on and, uh, you know, if if, what? if I if any of the you know, that I have for you, not that you need it, but uh, don't back down, man. Just you, you got to keep out. <laughs> that would never ever happen. Never happened for Brian. I got to say, it's been a true pleasure and an honor. You know, I've uh, I've obviously you know seen you and followed you and wondered how the hell does he have all this inside information for the past few years? Obviously on MMA Junkie, they loved you and, and seeing your praises and so. Uh, to be on the phone with you today was, was an amazing experience, and uh, I appreciate that. And let's keep the campaign going. You know, as you said, uh, Scott Coker and Rich Show, they're amazing minds in this sport. They know how to put the right fight together, and I'm sure they understand that this is the one. And tell us... Uh, so once again, do... man, thanks so much for having me on, and uh, I look forward to it. And tell us, your what's your Twitter for everybody? Twitter, at, at Justin McCauley, J-U-S-C-I-N-M-C-C-U-L-L-Y, little C, big C. There it is. All right, Justin, thanks, man. Be good. Right on, my man. Thanks, Brian. All right.